people think that if you add carbohydrates to your diet, you will need more and more insulin and your glucose will get higher and higher. It's just not true. The system is more complicated than that. And I think we need to give it more credit for, for what it's designed to do. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Hi friends, great to be here with you. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. In my career, I've worked with many people, including elite professional athletes, to improve their health, performance, and longevity. And I'm currently involved in research with a group of nutrition scientists in Australia, looking at dietary patterns and mental health. Today is the first episode of The Proof. I sit down with my good friend, diabetes educator and exercise physiologist, Drew Harrisburg. Drew will be a regular on this show. You can expect to see him once a month or so, where we sit down in between my episodes with other experts for a free-flowing chat about various things that are on our mind. In this episode, we talk about blood glucose, continuous glucose monitors or CGMs, are they worth using if you don't have diabetes, meat and longevity, silly claims we saw on social media, and a little bit of information about the format of this new show. Please do enjoy, and I'll catch you on the other side. I did a post last week on caffeine. Don't know if you saw that. I didn't. Sorry. I'm a, so, I'm a loyal follower, but I, I didn't see it. There's pretty good data out there that shows regular coffee consumption lowers risk of cardiovascular disease. And there's been like a few different proposed mechanisms. Mm. And recently they found that caffeine actually acts on a receptor and helps clear LDL cholesterol. Mm. So I did this post about caffeine and a lot of people asked me, if you don't drink coffee, yeah. is there another option? And uh, matcha doesn't have as much caffeine as coffee, but mm. you know, certainly Enough to get still a has, has a fair bit. Yeah, nice. I, I, yeah, I looked into caffeine as well because of the relationship with diabetes. It was really interesting. So like I noticed that when I was having my morning coffee, it would spike my blood glucose. And then I sort of, I was trying to figure out the mechanism, like why this would happen. I ended up writing a, a really big article, like a blog post about it and explaining all the mechanisms. But when I was looking at the literature in type two, the relationship was the inverse. So even though caffeine can cause this temporary, I don't know if you can call it insulin resistance, but reduced glucose tolerance or mm -hmm. less insulin sensitivity, long-term ca uh, caffeine intake is associated with less type 2 diabetes interesting yeah really so the acute response doesn't necessarily like represent the mm. chronic we see exposure that elsewhere. yeah we see that elsewhere in other exercise yeah true. increases blood pressure right but reduces blood pressure long term probably and reduces risk of cardiovascular disease exactly right yeah, so it's it's that's interesting because it speaks to perhaps the uh, something having exerting a, a different effect acutely mm. compared to what it does chronically. Yeah. Um, Hormesis. Yeah, similar to oil as well, actually. And that's where I think a lot of people get a little tripped up with oil. Mm. There are some studies, and I used to look at these studies and was somewhat concerned. Mm. There are some studies that show acutely when you consume certain oils, you can have impaired endothelial cell function. Mm -hmm. But then if you look at the consumption of oil outside of the postprandial period, yep. how does it affect artery function right. and it seems to improve right. endothelial function. Is that including olive oil? Including olive oil. Yeah, okay. And there was a, uh, a paper out on olive oil about a month ago. You probably, a lot of different people posted about it mm. and it was looking at US to US uh, cohorts. So this is observational data and... It, again, it showed significant benefits in terms of mortality, mm. lower risk of cancer, cardiovascular disease for those who were regularly consuming olive oil versus not. Mm. And then it also went a, a layer deeper and compared it to butter and to mayonnaise, to vegetable oils, mm. other, other things. And uh, again, olive oil compared to those was better in terms of health outcomes, mm. although not better than vegetable oils. 
Oh, really? Which was interesting. Yeah. They right. were the same. There was no significant. They're getting a bad rap, eh, at the moment. Yeah. Vegetable oil needs a new PR team. I mean, I don't know if they are healthy or not. I truly have not looked into it to the extent that you have. I feel like you've got to study to, to support or, or dismiss everything. You know what? I'm actually going to give you a new name. It's not Simon Hill anymore. <laughs> Science Hill. <laughs> you've got to well, study for everything. I, I don't have a strong, strong position on vegetable oils mm. in that... I'm not super interested because I guess from a, a personal point of view, I'm not consuming vegetable oils and I don't eat a lot ultra processed foods mm -hmm. um, or a lot of them anyway. And I cook with olive oil. Right. But I do think it is interesting because you're right. It's super, it's a very heated yeah. debate. And there are, there are certain people out there that suggest that vegetable oils in particular, seed oils are toxic. Mm. And, you know, usually I see this coming from the low carb community. Yep. And I think they're looking to point to one thing that can explain obesity, explain the increase in type 2 diabetes, something other than animal foods. Mm. And they're looking to, to, to find, you know, one explanation. Mm. I think nutrition is a lot more complicated than that. For sure. And, and also when you think about vegetable oils, they also get sort of tangled up, it gets messy, given that their inclusion into diets is often found in ultra processed foods. Right. So how do you disentangle that mm. and determine, is it ultra processed foods, which as a food matrix have a whole lot of stuff in exactly. them, added sugars, artificial flavors, um, there's, you know, vegetable oils, no doubt, mm. and there could be emulsifiers and they are very hyper palatable and easily over consumed, mm. which leads to weight gain. How do you disentangle that and, and look more at the independent effect of the vegetable oil? Is vegetable oil by itself mm -hmm. inherently harmful? Yeah, right. And I think that's an interesting question. It is. I, I think that the, the food matrix sort of conversation is actually really important. And that same sort of way of thinking, I actually had to apply to my own little self experiment with, with coffee. So initially, I blamed my increased glucose excursion on the oat milk. And then I was like, you know what, I'm just going to cut the oat milk out and start having black coffees and see what happens. And it didn't really change much. So even black coffee was causing me to have this increased you know, blood glucose response to the meal, which then makes you think, well, what is it in coffee that's causing that? And, and the caffeine itself was the culprit. Not, not in a bad way. It sounds like I'm framing it negatively, but so caffeine- this is when you were having a cup of coffee with a meal at the same time? No, this is on its own. Yeah. On its own. Yeah, in isolation. A cup of coffee in the morning. So usually my routine is I do my, my long walk with my dog, go for a swim and then grab a coffee. That morning coffee will need a dose of insulin, even mm -hmm. if, if there's no carbohydrates being consumed with the meal. So no carbohydrates from oat milk, no food intake, just a black coffee on its own. So it, it's just so interesting that it's so easy, actually. It's so easy to blame a nutrient or a macronutrient within that sort of matrix without knowing what it is and pinpointing What do you exactly. think the mechanism is in terms of why, why would coffee as a food or caffeine, if it's caffeine, be doing that? So it's all about the hormonal response by the body from when you drink caffeine. So, so the main sort of two hormones that would come up are cortisol and adrenaline. So caffeine is, is a stimulant that uh, releases cortisol and adrenaline. Those two hormones have an important role in the body and they actually have the opposite role of insulin. So insulin's role is to get glucose into cells. Cortisol and adrenaline try to mobilize glucose from the liver Mm -hmm. and provide you with a fuel source. So if you think about like you're, you're in a fight or flight situation, you need glucose, quick, rapid energy. Adrenaline's going to kick in. You know, you're, you're about to run away from a, a tiger that's chasing you down. Adrenaline kicks in, gives you this wave of energy, both in just a feeling of energy, but also molecular glucose mm -hmm. entering the bloodstream. So when you have this, this caffeine intake and you get this adre adrenal response, Obviously, your liver has to do something and it puts glucose in the bloodstream. And because I don't produce insulin, I have to predict what that coffee is going to do. Whilst for you, your body would just sort of fix it mm -hmm. almost immediately. 
But some so, of us better than others. Yes. And we may not know. That's true too. Yeah, so you, you, you have no idea really what your insulin response is going to be. Let's make sure we go into we'll, that. We will. We'll touch on that. Um, but interestingly, because I've had a CGM in for now about three weeks. Is I've, that, a, is that uh, a special brand or? No, just a, there's the main two that are sort of used in the diabetic community. Well, actually not even just the diabetic community now. It's, uh, it's, it's infiltrated the general population mm -hmm. and athletes are using them are the Freestyle Libre and uh, the Dexcom. The Dexcom is what I'm using at the moment. It's, uh, it's a, so for people who don't know what a CGM is, continuous glucose monitor. And it collects data and sends it to your phone. So I can just check my, like, I better check now, actually, because I don't want to have a low while we're in the middle of this pod. So yeah, you, you open up your phone and basically you get a reading um, of what your blood glucose is in the current moment and the tr direction that it's trending. And then a ton of other amazing data. Mm -hmm. The data is incredible. Um, but since I've been wearing this, I can see to the second when I consume that coffee, two minutes later, it starts to trend up. 30 minutes an hour, you can see exactly what's happened. And the reason I know it's the caffeine is because I fast till like midday. So that's the only food intake is that coffee. And just like clockwork, just trends up every time. Mm. So, so I do need a bit of insulin. In saying that, I need more insulin when I'm having an oat milk coffee. Yeah. So it's the carbohydrate on top of it. Sure. Right. Just compounding it. Yeah, really. pretty much. Exactly right. So before you have been wearing the CGM and to manage living with diabetes, you've been doing the finger pricks. 15 finger pricks a day. Yeah. It's so how have you found the, the transition in terms of the management side of things, quality of life, and also your, uh, how well you're uh, managing those blood glucose curves and, and managing to kind of, you know, maximize time in range? So when I was doing the, the finger pricks, I thought that 15 a day was a lot. It sounds like a big number and it is. Mm. 15 finger pricks a day is quite a lot. Yeah, it's, yeah maybe go through what, what's involved. Every single time you do a finger prick, right. finger so, prick. Yeah, so you, you load the glucose meter up with a test strip. You use a lancing device to prick your finger. You squeeze a bit of blood out and you insert it into the machine. It analyzes the blood sample and gives you a reading back. The problem with that is it's a snapshot of a very dynamic system. So it's always changing. Your blood glucose throughout the day is always changing. So if you test your blood glucose and it gives you a single reading, but you're on an up curve or an uptrend, well, you don't know whether you're trending up, down or flat, right? There's no reference point to, to measure against. So you see this number and you go, okay, well, my blood glucose is six. Great. But I don't know if it's going to be 6.5 in five minutes time, or if it's going to go up to nine, or is it going down to four? Like... It doesn't give you trends or directions. So even though you're doing 15 a day, you're just not understanding the full picture. You're not getting a clear image of how your diabetes management is. And what you're, the, the main thing you're not getting is your time in range, which essentially is a percentage of time that you spend between a target range that you set for yourself. So I've set my range at 3.9 to 9 or 9.8. I can't remember exactly. Um, and at the moment, I mean touch wood, it stays this way, but I've had really, really good control, 95 to 100% time in, it's like when I say 100% time in range, maybe for two days straight, and then the next day, 95, 90, but well above 90%. Um, so with the finger pricks, you don't get that information, you don't get that data. Um, but from a management point of view, the reason that I enjoy it so much is that the psychological uh, just burden of just jamming that lancing device into your hand 15 times a day, day after day, we're talking like 50,000 plus, 100,000 plus over the 10 years or whatever it is. I don't know the exact number, but tens of thousands of, of finger pricks. It just takes a toll, mate. It wears your skin out. It doesn't necessarily hurt all the time, but it's just, it gets exhausting. And I've never had diabetes burnout until now. And I've this is like the first time in 10 years that I've sort of woken up 2 a.m. and I'm like, oh, I've got to prick my finger to check. Like, it just, it kind of got to me and I'm like, I'm ready for a CGM. Based on what you said about, you know, not knowing when you take, when you do a test, not knowing if it's trending up or trending down, mm -hmm. having the continuous curve would also 
uh, you know, relieve you of some kind of mental strain as well in terms of, of managing it, predicting it. Should I exercise? Should I eat? Exactly. What should I eat? It makes it a lot safer. So what it does is it gives you an arrow. It either gives you an arrow pointing up, diagonally up, straight, diagonally down or down. And if it's going down or up very fast, it'll give you a double arrow. Mm. It also has alerts and alarms. So if I'm dropping really low, it'll beep and say, you're going to have an urgent low in 20 minutes, time to get some glucose in the system. Mm. Or so you can set an alert if you go above what, you, what your target is, and then it'll tell you you're above your target, you might want to fix this. So you can either use physical activity, which is what I mostly like to do, but also you can inject your insulin or do whatever you need to do in your management. So what's the downside? Is of the is CGM? it just a, a te technological advancement that's making it now available or is it price or, you know, why would someone not want to use a CGM over the finger brick? I, th I think for people over 21, price is a problem. It's not <coughs> subsidized for, I think it's, is it 21 or 18? I, I got to fact check this after. But, but for children, under, I think it's 21. Under the age of 21, it is subsidized. Over the age of 21 for adults, you have to spend, it's probably around three and a half to four grand a year. Um, it's also, it's an invasive technology. So mm. the, the sensor sits underneath your skin. There's a probe that sits under your mm. skin. I wore one in uh, Yeah, you wore one. LA That's right. Yeah, yeah. A couple of weeks. That's right. You use the, the Freestyle Libre. Yeah which is an Abbott device mm -hmm. and, and I'm using the Dexcom, but they're very similar. Mine wasn't actually connected to an app. Yours was the, you had the scanner. I had the scanner. Yeah. So it's probably a step back in terms of technology. I do think that they have an app now. Yeah, they do. They do. For some reason it wasn't available to me because I was in America and my phone was set to Australian settings. Right. So I couldn't download okay. the American app. Yeah. So, I mean, these apps, they, they are brilliant. They, on, I'm not exaggerating when I say this, they are life saving because if you are having an, a, a dangerous or severe low in your sleep, you can slip into a coma mm -hmm. and die, right? And, and sadly, a lot of type 1 uh, diabetics or people with type 1 diabetes, I should say, uh, do die in their sleep from these sort of terribly low blood glucose levels caused by overdosing on insulin or drinking alcohol. There's, there's a number of mm -hmm. factors that can do it. So if you can have an alarm system that wakes you up and alerts you, it's a lifesaver. It's unbelievable. It's, huge. it's amazing. And it, that also uh, has to be a good thing for parents with kids. Massive. And the parents where, where can- management can be really stressful that's right. and scary. And the parents can access the app yeah. on their phone. So they can be in their bedroom. They'll get the alarm. Let's say their 10-year-old child is sleeping and doesn't wake up to their own alert. Parents get in there wake them up, mm. give them some glucose, problem solved. Really interesting finding that I've had out of the CGM. It confirmed things that I thought, I can't say I knew it because I didn't have all the data from the finger pricks, but at least I thought that I had great time in range and then my control was really good and my standard de deviation was good. It did confirm those things, so I was very happy. But the one thing that it really highlighted was that I've been going low overnight and sleeping through it for years. Wow. So what's, I've had to reduce what's the danger of that. So similar to what I alluded to before, you can slip into, you can have seizure, coma. Um, it's just, not, I mean, general brain health. It's mm -hmm. not good to have glucose starvation to the brain overnight. Um, it's usually in the beginning when you're diagnosed, you have symptoms of that these things are happening. Like you have sweatiness, clammy, um, shaky. You feel, you, it wakes you up. But I've been sleeping through this for years without knowing. So I've put this CGM in. And for the first two weeks, the bloody thing was beeping all night. So it totally ruined my sleep, but it potentially saved me in, in, in other ways. Um, so I'm chronically sleep deprived because it's just been alerting me every hour. So what do you adjust? My in, basal insulin. You, you adjust the basal I insulin? I didn't realize I had way too much basal mm. in my system. And the, the, the reduction has been significant. So... I've cut my basal down since using a CGM by about six units. So I used to take 15 and I, and I, I take nine units of basal now. Nine for people who have diabetes might know that that number for someone who's my size is a really low amount of basal. Mm. Nine units, one dose per day. I'm 85 kilos. I should be taking, should in quotations, be taking significantly more than that. But I, I'd say my lifestyle, very active, Lots of exercise, plant-based diet, relatively low in saturated fat. 
those are the pillars that have sort of allowed mm -hmm. me to have this low basal need and also improved insulin sensitivity. So you, you mentioned time in range and I want to talk about these devices for people without diabetes as well. And we're seeing more and more people use these. So I'm interested yeah. in what your thoughts are around, clearly these are, are wonderful devices for someone that's living with diabetes, potentially someone who is pre-diabetic. Mm -hmm. Uh, to get better insight into what their blood glucose looks like. How do you feel about folks without diabetes or pre-diabetes using these? And second part of that question, what's the meaningful data here? Because, you know, I hear you talking about time and range a lot. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I look online, I see people talking about the steepness of the curve mm -hmm. and whether th their blood glucose is flat or not mm. being uh, indicative of a healthy response or a healthy meal, for example. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. There's so much to unpack here. All right. My initial feelings about general population wearing CGMs is very mixed because on one end, I, I admire the people out there who want to take control of their health and find other ways to measure biomarkers and maybe improve their health. So it's commendable to see people doing that. But I think the part that's missing is the education around the data. So what good is data if you have no idea how to interpret it? So, you know, if you think about our heart rate or blood pressure on a daily basis, how, how it fluctuates. When you walk up a flight of stairs and your heart rate goes up, or if you go to the gym and do a set on the bench press and your blood pressure goes up, what, knowing that fact about your blood pressure or heart rate, how is that going to impact the way you live your life? So would some people say, oh, well, that, that number went up. I better not go to the gym anymore. or Better not take that flight of stairs. Better not take that flight of stairs. Surely people aren't doing that. But I guess the, the sort of analogy I'm trying to make here is that if you don't know how to interpret natural fluctuations and you don't know what's normal mm -hmm. and physiologically normal, then what's the point in knowing these things if you're living a healthy life anyway? Mm -hmm. So I think that people are misinterpreting the data. You're seeing these CGMs on athletes and general population as it's almost become a fashion piece. And it's, it's biohacking. Kind of, it's biohacking. It's kind of like a symbol of, look at me, I'm, I care so much about my health. It's kind of like become almost sexy in a weird way because it's a medical device for diabetes. Mm -hmm. Very but strange. Where does it work? So if, if someone without diabetes, right. and talk about athletes, is there is there some meaningful data within there that, you would be getting yes. that you can use to improve your health. Yeah. So the meaningful part would come from, let's just say hypothetically we gave everyone in the population a CGM. We're probably going to diagnose some undiagnosed pre-diabetes or even type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. That's great. So you, that's like a screening tool. Correct. It's like a mass scale, pretty mm -hmm. simple screening tool. It's, it's, I guess it's self-screening though. So then you've got to rely on those individuals going to their doctor and saying, hey, is this normal? Or? But in that instance, you probably don't need to be wearing it all year. You'd probably wear it for a couple of weeks, Correct. maybe once, twice a year, get some data. Uh, no, I'm, I'm healthy or no, exactly. I look like I'm pre-diabetic range. Exactly right. So what you're seeing is, and I guess this is maybe a downfall, is that we're not seeing type or, or people who might be predisposed to type 2 wearing them. We're seeing athletes who really aren't predisposed to type 2 at all. So the data they're getting is very different. It's not going to expose an underlying issue. Mm. They're using it for performance and so-called longevity and, and overall health. So let's try to unpack this slowly. So time in range is, like I said, it's given as a percentage of the time you spend in your target range. And for folks who maybe uh, are hearing that for the first time, that means there's a, there's a lower level milligrams per deciliter of what your blood glucose should be. Yep. There's an upper level of the sort of normal physiological right. limit and anything between that lower and upper level is considered in range. Correct. What it doesn't account for though is area under the curve necessarily. So you could be 100% time in range but sitting with an average glucose of 6.2 or 100% time in range with an average glucose of 4.2. Mm -hmm. Both of you have achieved 100% time in range. So it can be a little bit misleading. So the average glucose is very important too. And then we add on to that the HbA1c. Which so is, come back to that. Yeah. 
So average glucose is also important. So, yes. so do we know like if someone has an average glucose of, uh, of within the normal range but at the higher end versus someone who's right. within the normal range at the lower end, do we know that there's a difference in terms of health outcomes? So the rhetoric you'll see is that the lower the better, the flatter the better. And I do not think that that is an evidence-based claim. I think that the lower the better, the flatter the better sounds like a cool story, but I don't believe that that means you are going to live a longer life or be healthier than someone who has totally normal fluctuations within the normal physiological range that are very acute. So it's a transient increase and you come back to base. Mm, that would be interesting. Like I haven't seen any data that suggests that either. I'd be interested to know if there's anything out there. I don't think there is. I don't think there is. I did speak to the, the guys from Levels. So Levels mm. is that, that new app that essentially, it's actually for people without diabetes, which is interesting. This is like an app that measures, or I guess it's a data collection. I think that's why it's hard to get one. They're, they're finding it hard to supply people um, well, because of that, I think. Because Levels, from my understanding, when I spoke to them, uh, we did a little Zoom, they don't provide the CGM. No. Right? You use a Dexcom or a Freestyle mm -hmm. Libre and then it syncs to the app that they provide. Mm -hmm. So what they're doing is they're, they're basically data collection and analysis. That's right. And I think because uh, f folks without diabetes are not covered within the American healthcare system, I'm not sure exactly how it works, mm. but from what I've heard, it's much harder to get your hands on one of I those. I see what you mean. And there's a limited number for people without diabetes. Right. And it's hard to go to your doctor and request one. Got you. If you're not pre-diabetic or, sorry, living with pre-diabetes. We should no, I think, clarify I think that. you can say that. If you should clarify that though, because you said diabetic <laughs> community before. Yeah. And uh, I've been pulled up before yeah. from folks in the community, rightly, you know, sending me information and saying, <laughs> I, I think you should say people living with diabetes yeah, I, I, I make that slip up a lot. I think you can say pre-diabetic because you're categorizing the condition. You're not categorizing an individual. Okay. But somebody living with diabetes, technically, or if you want to be politically correct, is not a diabetic. There's somebody mm -hmm. living with type sure. one or type two diabetes. But pre-diabetes or pre-diabetic is the condition. Which is the same as living with obesity as opposed to, to an obese. Being obese. You're yeah. obese, yeah. I think. Look, I don't know. It's, it's tricky. I always slip up, but I try my best. It's hard. Yeah. Um, so just going back to the CGM. So let's think about the data that could be useful for people without diabetes, even though I don't mm. recommend that everyone wears one. Sure, there's some interesting things. So I did see a dietitian online uh, wearing a, a CGM. This particular person went to do a HIIT workout and had an elevation in blood glucose with their HIIT training. Interesting which is a normal physiological mm -hmm. response in people with and without diabetes. Mm -hmm. It's way more pronounced in people with say type one, because when you do that workout, if you haven't anticipated how much insulin you're gonna need to cover that increased blood glucose curve, you could see a serious spike. And I'm talking like when I used to do um, like high, like even surfing, like anything that's high intensity or causes an adrenaline response, I could see my blood glucose go from five to 15. And again, this is the liver dumping glucose into the blood. Exactly. Exactly. It's, that, it's, it's the same mechanism. And, and without the insulin, you can't turn that tap off. Yeah. Insulin, yeah. insulin is essentially the off switch for the liver to say, hey, start storing glucose, stop pouring it out. We've got plenty. Because people with type 1 don't produce insulin, we've got to predict mm -hmm. what's going to happen. So it's, you're thinking all the time. Right. Type 1 is... is Full-time job. It's, yeah. You're always thinking about the variables that are going to impact your blood glucose. That's why you're great to talk about CGMs though because you have what over a decade of experience managing your blood glucose, also being well aware of insulin. Right. And a lot of the time this the conversation around blood glucose is – It ends the, there. Yeah. It ends there. Yeah, that's and it. And it's, it's, it's not uh, appreciating the fact – that two people can have the same blood glucose levels or response, but have very different insulin levels. Exactly right. That, which is such an important part of the puzzle. And, and that does come back to before we talked about average glucose and I asked you that question. Yeah. Okay. But without understanding where someone's insulin levels are at, you don't have the full picture there either. Exactly. Right. So you myself and let's say someone else that's not living with diabetes, we could have the same average glucose, but my 
my pancreas might be working twice as hard oh, yeah. and thus pumping out way more insulin in order to maintain that level. That's exactly right. So, so it's you're getting half the picture with CGM data, mm -hmm. with glucose data. What you're missing out on is actually really important because knowing your insulin response to your meals and your basal insulin response. So put it this way, you can have a totally normal blood glucose level, but be hyperinsulinemic, have huge amounts, super mm -hmm. physiological amounts of insulin to keep you in that normal blood glucose range. But if you're only measuring your glucose, you don't know what your insulin mm. levels are. So you you can be pre-diabetic or have pre-diabetes and seems like your blood glucose is actually normal. Mm -hmm. So again, the insulin is an impor important part of it. The only people on earth right now with the technology we have available that can actually know what their insulin requirements are are people with type 1 because we produce zero oh. insulin. Yeah. So we get this complete picture. I mean, levels... I mean, they don't use their own device, but Libra, surely these companies are, they understand that. And I, I wonder what is required for that device to not only be detecting glucose, but mm. to be detecting insulin in real time and just to superimpose those those two graphs. Well, whoever comes up with that tech and gets to market first is going to mm. make a lot of money because that's that's good technology. I cut you that. off. You were talking about <laughs> that's right. so much the, to get the through. hit. Yes, training. yes. So HIIT training can increase your blood glucose level. I saw a, no, a person without diabetes do a HIIT workout and, and noticed a, a slight increase, albeit extremely small, well within the normal range. It was, she went she went from a four point something to maybe a five or a six. We're talking a one millimole increase. Now, if you don't know that that's a normal response and you don't realize that you're still in the completely normal range, then how is that meaningful data? What, what is the point of even using that data to, if it's not going to impact the way you work out, the way you live your life? If she's going outside of the normal range, right, then maybe it starts to become data that she can actually use to her advantage. But I'd say that most people, and you would know that you did this. Mm. You saw my curves. <laughs> what curves? You were flat. And I was eating a lot of carbohydrates. Toxic carbohydrates every day <laughs> and you had a flat line and i'm the same you've seen my curves i'm also eating a high carbohydrate diet and i'm flat so i think there's there's so much to sort of work through here but the, the general message that i would say is it's probably we, we aren't educated enough yet on the general population and what blood glucose should look like over a day if you're within the normal physiological range and you're having natural even let's call it a spike after mm -hmm. a meal, as long as it comes straight back down to normal, that is also no a normal response. Mm -hmm. So I think the flatter the better can get people into issues. And I, I, I know this from personal experience. When I was first diagnosed, I was so afraid of having fluctuations that I would change my lifestyle, my food choices and the things I did to try achieve a flat line, mm -hmm. thinking that flat line is better, flat is healthier. And that was also based on information that I got sort of from that paleo community when I was in that uh, dietary phase, yeah. right? Which was flatter the better. Think about this with heart rate. If you thought, let's flatter the better, you just try and sleep all day. <laughs> you wouldn't do anything, <laughs> right? But seriously though, I actually got to a point where I was afraid to eat a meal. I was fasting for 20 hours day after day, just going, you know what? My blood sugar is perfect right now. I don't want to ruin this. I'm not going to eat. Just keep it, keep it in there for as long as possible, better time in range, lower number. I'm going to skip that meal. I'm just going to fast. Or I would over-exercise to keep it low and I was chronically overtrained. So it can, this data can actually be mm. a bit of a devil if you don't know how to use it and interpret it. So what if people are doing the same thing? What if people are changing their diet to try achieve a flat line and re or introducing foods and eliminating other foods that overall leads to worse outcomes? That's the study I want to see. Yeah. Take a group of people, they're not living with diabetes, give them CGMs and look at their diet quality. So and how it changes. So you can show them the curves and give them the exact same instructions that people are currently getting now mm. and how they're using the data. And just look at their, there are a lot of different diet quality indexes. Mm. You know, we know what foods are associated with good outcomes, what foods are kind of neutral, what foods are associated with poor outcomes. It's very easy to score someone's diet. Mm. Um, a lot of the time, 
you know, people point to like Mediterranean diet indexes as a, a, a good sort of index for looking at diet quality and just give people the CGMs and over a sort of four, eight, 12 week period, yeah. what happens to their diet quality? Yeah. Because if you are following this, this kind of rhetoric of flat is better, mm. then I can, I can imagine that having, for example, bacon, eggs and butter might lead in certain people, in most people, to a, a flatter blood glucose curve than having, let's say, uh, black beans, tofu scramble and with you're vegetables. Right. You're, you're totally right. It will. So you'll see people essentially going on a low carb, maybe all the way to ketogenic diet to achieve these flat-lined blood glucose readings mm. and eliminating at the same time. So as you get this twofold swing healthful carbohydrates that they probably even would improve their performance and improve their health. Mm. I will say though, to give a little bit of credit where it's due, when I was talking to the guys from Levels, they said that they have had anecdotes of people who are on a ketogenic diet who put on a CGM and ate a carbohydrate, believe it or not, they ate a carbohydrate. And shocking. They, shocking, news. shocking, huge news. And they didn't see, not only did they, they didn't see the spike they were expecting, but their ketones were still in the sort of ketogenic mm. sweet spot, whatever that is, which led them to think, well, I can actually eat a banana after my workout and still be in ketosis, assuming mm. it's after a workout when you're most insulin sensitive and your body's primed to metabolize the glucose. So it can go either way. So these people on a ketogenic diet have actually started to increase and, and uh, add back in a little bit of carbohydrate after workouts. Mm -hmm. So they're not fearing this curve anymore and they know that they can still be in ketosis. Mm -hmm. So there's a potential value for people if they are on a ketogenic diet using a CGM. You might find that you can tolerate some carbohydrate in the day and the other, you don't have to go all the way to the ketogenic yeah. level. The other outcome in that study would be good to look at performance. When people are wearing these CGMs yeah. and they're making different dietary choices, what happens to their performance in, in whatever sort of sport or athletic endeavor they're involved in. Yeah, I, I, I don't think we're there yet. I think that there's plenty of research to be done. I do know of, of a few athletes that have used CGMs and noticed that their uh, response to aerobic training, like zone two training, sends their blood glucose down, which is what you see in people with type di diabetes as well, which is interesting. So what I sort of take away is that whether you have type one diabetes or you don't, whether you're an athlete or not, our bodies are so fine tuned to respond to the stimulus that you get mm -hmm. from exercise and food and for most people like yourself, your body will look after those those parameters quite easily. It's automatic. The process is totally automated. You don't need to be sort of tweaking these minor, minor things and get too granular. Uh, but someone like me, I, I can get a lot of feedback from this stuff and I can make those small changes that will improve my diabetes management. So I'm... I'm sitting on the fence. That's my. That's the verdict. I, I don't know yet. To, to to tie a bow in this, we were chatting offline, and we had an analogy about the two cars. Okay, and that kind of speaks to the importance of understanding insulin. Yes. In this scenario, do you want to? Just... Who, who's ballsy enough to take this analogy to air? <laughs> we were working on this analogy. We we're like, oh, I think it works. Yeah, I think analogy two, okay. analogy one. Is okay. Probably not. So, uh, so the analogy was is, is a little. Uh, R-rated. So <laughs> go with analogy two. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely do not air analogy one. Okay. Let's just make sure this is the correct one. Yeah. So imagine you've got two cars, identical cars from the outside. Let's call them a Toyota. Two Toyotas on a racetrack. Toyota Celica. That was my first one. That was car. your, was it? Yeah. <laughs> wow, you've come a long way. Sally the Celica. Nice. I love <laughs> Sally. Yeah, manual. Jeez. Oh, manual. I also had a manual. Great car. Yeah. I miss the manual. Yeah. Um, you know you're driving when you're in a manual. You do, even if it's a Celica. Mm. So the analogy is, and we're, this is a work in progress, so don't judge. Two Toyota Celicas on a racetrack side by side. They're both going to do one lap. Mm, we're racing. We're racing. <laughs> at the end of the race, both cars reach the finish line at the exact same time. One car had a fuel economy that was double the other. So it was just working much harder, right? That fuel output in this analogy represents the pancreas secreting insulin. Mm -hmm. 
So you can have two glucose readings that are exactly the same. Mm. One requires the pancreas to work double as hard as the other, but you still have the same glucose reading. Mm. Being the glucose reading, being the finish line. Being the finish line. Exactly right. So you can achieve the same outcome. One of them, you see the system working a bit harder mm -hmm. and that's the insulin. What is the role of the pancreas? It's to produce insulin to control your glucose level. So I, I guess if you're you know, eating a diet that is setting yourself up for insulin resistance or you're not insulin sensitive, but you have good CGM readings, is there some tweaks you can make? Are there some tweaks you can make that will allow you to be more insulin sensitive and still have good gl glucose readings? And That's the, right. So you might be able to even maintain that average blood glucose level. Sure. But have less insulin sure. being produced. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the, the fallacies is people think that if you add carbohydrates to your diet, you will need more and more insulin and your glucose will get higher and higher. Mm. It's just not true. The system is more complicated than that. And I think we need to give it more credit for, for what it's designed to do. Well, welcome to the CGM podcast. <laughs> <laughs> speaking of I that. I thought that was going to be five minutes, but I, uh, I think we've been going for about 30. I know. But speaking of uh, namings of podcasts. Yes. Do you want to drop some news? The Proof. The Proof Podcast? The Proof Podcast. That's the uh, evolution of the Plant Proof Podcast. So are we saying goodbye to the Plant Proof Podcast completely? So that's no longer... We are saying goodbye to, to that. It is a little sad, right? It is. Yeah. We should take a minute. I mean, it's it's the content's always going to be there. Sure. So that will, it'll live forever. You know how many people you've upset right now? Yeah, potentially. I did I did think about that. But yeah, you should have done a poll. It's certainly, uh, change is inevi inevitable. Hmm. You know, I learned that in year 10 business management. <laughs> that was the first sentence. Really? Um, and... It's a it's a important evolution mm. for no, the show. I, I fully back it. I think it's great. I think and it's great. I think you're gonna like I said, you're gonna hurt some feelings. But these days everyone's got hurt feelings. Yeah, so let me just life. say on the record, I still eat plants and only plants. <laughs> okay. And dropping the the plant from the title is uh, you know, by no means related to my diet at all. It's simply because I want to expand the show. Mm. I want to still have a, a science-based lens, yeah. but just talk to people with more diverse backgrounds. I think it's a good call. I, I think you'll open the doors, not, not only to this show, but getting you on other shows mm. because you can go there as the individual. Science Hill instead of, <laughs> instead of, instead of going as the-, the Proof the, with Science Hill. <laughs> instead of going on other people's shows and being instantly pigeonholed as the, you know, the vegan guy- you know, you can now open some doors. And yeah, and, great. and like all of the listeners, I have interest outside of just nutrition. Right. You know, I want to explore exercise, physiology more mm. and sleep mm. and stress. And, you know, I I want to be careful not to make make people believe that nutrition is everything for mm. health span and lifespan. It's a very, very important component. But we know that there are other parts of our lifestyle that we need to think about. Yeah. And you can have a, a wonderful diet but not be paying attention to anything else and you're leaving health on the table. Yeah. So, you know, in my personal life, I have a very holistic approach and I feel like on the show, you know, I've dabbled in some other themes but it has been very, very focused on nutrition. Mm. And definitely the listeners that have been there since day one and have sort of been on this journey, you know, I think they're also ready for some some new material yeah and you know it doesn't mean that there won't be nutrition focused episodes there's uh, i think in the first five or six maybe two-thirds of them are still food mm. focused and you know i have an episode with jed fay phd on uh, phytochemicals yep. which is really interesting he's been studying those for about 20 years with a lot of focus on sulforaphane mm -hmm. in uh, broccoli and broccoli sprouts, and so we we take a deep dive uh, into that. I have the Erica and Justin Sonnenberg on from Stanford Uni, who are arguably the sort of the the number one researchers in the world looking at the gut microbiome, and they they their work has gone right back to looking at the ancestral microbiome mm, uh, and and how our microbiome has changed uh, as we've moved into this very modern industrialized world. Mm. 
uh, I have Andrew Huberman on. Oh, yeah. uh, there's a number of, of episodes I've already recorded. Cool. And it, I mean, th- this will now be in video, yeah. which is, uh, I think, a bonus. I had a lot of people requesting for the full episodes to be in video format. And truthfully, it's just a lot of work. Yeah, it is. To, you know, to, do, to do these episodes, to prepare, to, to have a videographer, to do you know, some basic editing and get both video and audio up is another level mm. of production. Yeah. And I didn't really want to kind of do it half-baked. Yeah. <laughs> so um, all of that will now be available on YouTube. So nice. So folks, do you, do you watch I podcasts? I do, a lot. Yeah. I watched, uh, the last one I watched was yours on Rich. It was good. Mm. I always tell people, if you're going to listen to Simon, but you have the ch- chance to watch him, just watch him. Why would you just listen? <laughs> Look at those baby blues. You got to <laughs> see them on the big screen. Now that was good. I, I enjoyed that yeah, episode a lot. He's got a great uh yeah, what's production. his uh, studio like? It looks Actually, you're talking about amazing. data. I, I wish that I'm wearing an aura and a whoop now and that's not sponsored. We should talk about sponsors actually though. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I have no relationship with aura and whoop. Not currently anyway, uh, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, so uh, I, Rich uh, has a incredible studio mm. uh, outside of Los Angeles. And I remember the first time that I walked in there, I didn't realize the kind of level of production yeah. and his, his prize setup was in a shipping container and it was at his home and, mm-hmm. you know, a bit more low key. Yeah. You know, when you record at someone's home, one of the nice things is you sort of turn up and it's, you know, you're in their house. It's very relaxed vibe. Yeah. There's no real reason to be nervous. Especially when you show up to a guy's house who sleeps in a tent. Yeah. Like you're not expecting an extravagant yeah. setup. Yeah. Well, I think I think now he has a, a glamping tent, so he has upgraded. Of course, from, he has. The, from the tent. Um, Just quickly, the the he he received some flack online for his. I don't know if you saw the headlines about. Just the st- stupid headlines written by I some journalists about the very tent. old. Story. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a whole another interesting story about living in the in in the tent, uh, but. So I, I, I turned up for the first episode that we did together and uh, had no reason to be nervous at all, got in and it's this fairly big production facility, yeah. um, you know, lots of people walking around with uh, tech gear and, yeah. and, and it kind of felt like a mini TV yeah. studio yeah. and, uh, you know, thinking that I was about to sit down and talk for a couple of hours was slightly nerve-wracking. Yeah. But you've, um, you've done TV. So you, when yeah. you show up to TV, you know what to expect. Yeah. But yeah. every time I am I feel the same nerves. Right. And what, run th- run, what runs through my mind is, what if I just blank? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't happen. No. When someone asks that question, you can re- usually just dig deep and you'll retrieve any sort of information that you have learnt well. Exactly. Um. <laughs> But still, yeah, you do but, it again, and, and when you're nervous. not, but when you're not expecting it, so you yeah. show up and you're not expecting it, and you're like, "Wait, I'm on TV today." That's yeah, it's like double as hard. So, <laughs> you know, and and the way that the production's set up, and he's got these big green seats, and then everything's dark, and it kind of just goes quiet. Mm. And if I had the aura, I wish I had one of these devices on. Check your heart rate. Able to, I think my heart rate was it was in the upper range. I'm not sure I was in range. Uh, yeah. and Blood pressure too, probably. And But then I went back second time and it was... Yeah, you, was you looked outside. relaxed even the first one. Yeah. So what was going on inside was not reflected on the outside. <laughs> yeah, inside I was like heating up and really? the heart was, was going. Yeah. Probably for the first couple of minutes. I actually said to Rich, I said, I, I, it would be interesting for you to have a heart rate monitor, you know, like the, all the fitness places like on now a screen. on the screen. I don't think that feedback is what you want when you're on air. <laughs> you're on one, like you're maxing out, your max heart rate. No, nah, yeah. probably not a good idea. Uh, um, no, that's awesome. So tell us about so the sponsors and just the, the format of the show and what the changes are. Yeah, so format wise, uh, still conversations with different people, mostly experts, um, people like yourself who have some qualifications, background in a certain field that can talk to a particular topic. 
and that can speak to the science in a very evidence-based way without hyperbole, mm-hmm. the nuance. What do we know? Where are the gray spots? What else would be good to learn? Yeah. Um, you know, less absolutes and more reliable information mm-hmm. that I think people can then, you know, I, I trust the audience. The audience is incredibly smart mm. and I think that they can, you know, they want this more nuanced information and and then they can make their own decisions in their own life but yeah. do so with, you know, a bit more confidence. So uh, different guests, a um, lot of professors and MDs and dietitians, mm-hmm. um, neuroscientists, different backgrounds and we'll be adding the video component um, and now that the team's expanding, I probably will be looking at sponsors. Right. So we're going through that process at the moment. Cool. Um, I was tossing up between different models. So there are different ways that you could monetize this. Mm-hmm. And I'll just speak completely openly here. Yeah. Um, the reason why that you know I need to think about monetizing it is that after four years of producing a couple hundred episodes, mm. um, you know, it's it's it is costly mm. to produce the show, and you, uh, you have you know graphic designers and the audio editors, and now I've got copywriter and videographer, and you know, most of the most of these people are spending a fair chunk of their week working on the show, and they have wages to pay, and wow. you know it <laughs> adds up. Sure, um, and you know I want to keep providing high quality content hopefully that is better and better um and to do that i need to somehow monetize the show so how dare you yeah make money <laughs> providing this service yeah. to help the world um <laughs> so you know i was reluctant though yeah. uh and yeah, people will judge. I was thinking about different ways, and one of them is to to go down the route of subscription mm-hmm. and use a paywall. Right. And th- the problem with that is that I I want this information to be accessible. Exactly. To reach more people. That's right. Uh, because I feel like a lot of this information is not, mm. and it's the going back to the nuance. Mm. You know, that's what's not appreciated by mainstream media so much. Yep. You know, it's a bit more clickbaity, a bit more 15 to 45 seconds. Yep. Uh, and I wanted to to give people, you know, another side. The thing, and, Yeah, the thing with paywall is, is even if it is a very, very affordable price, if people listen to 30 podcasts, then they're going to reach right. a point where they have to pick and choose and go, you know what, mm. I'm paying for 15. Imagine the next few also I also have to pay for. Well, I might have to cut a couple out. I'm not going to listen anymore. Last thing you want is to lose listeners based off, you know, two dollars fifty or whatever it, it might be. It's just it just doesn't seem right. I think what you're doing sounds a little bit more intelligent. Yeah. So I will uh, look to partner with sponsors. Hopefully, not too many. Mm. Hopefully, not chopping and changing. Right. Hopefully, just sponsors that I can build a relationship with yeah. who have services or products that I believe in would right. use myself. Uh, so that when I'm talking about what they're doing, I'm not lying to my audience. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and 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 that's that'll be my compass that guides those those sponsorship deals. Yeah. Uh, if it doesn't feel aligned, which is kind of one of the pillars that I want to explore with with the show, and and various pillars will come out um, that I'll detail on, on another episode. But um, if it doesn't feel aligned, mm. then it, it just won't happen. No, it makes sense. You just be authentic and use and, and speak about products that, that you believe in. I think that pretty much every single one of your listeners it goes without saying that that's what you would have done anyway. So I don't think you need to be, you know, having disclaimers being like, guys, I use this product. Like we know, we, we trust you. So if that wasn't uh, get things off off your chest, but it kind of <laughs> felt like I did get that off my chest. Good, it's relieving. <laughs> yeah, so what we've done is for, for the guys, guys and gals listening and anyone else, um, we have played around with a few sort of themes and topics to, to kind of delve into for this pod, just to have a bit of fun. We thought mm-hmm. just to change it up, you know, it's a new show, new format, potentially. Let's dive into sort of some topics that maybe we wouldn't have been able to speak about on the, on the Plant Proof podcast, but now the proof, mm-hmm. we can talk about whatever we want. That's right. I love it. 
Um, so get it off your chest. And I've skipped forward of the good news of the week. We'll come back to that. <laughs> well, that was, yeah, it's hard to find get good it, news right now. Get it off your chest. Oh, this, this is a great segment. What have you got for me? So, all right. The idea with this segment is, I guess we, we, are, we are positive guys. We love life. We like to inspire people and create a positive, you know, high vibration environment, right? But every now and then, you know, the, the real human emotion side of us, you, you don't want to suppress it too much and you want to just get something off your chest. I've got a lot I want to get off my chest, but I'm only allowed to pick one, right? Is that, is that how it works? Drew loves to get things off his chest. <laughs> I do. I love a good rant. That's For, where this came from. I, yeah. would shout, I would say to yeah. Drew, get it off your chest, mate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so here we go. We've got to be serious because this, this topic actually is kind of serious. Um, I'm sure everyone knows by now, but a couple of weeks ago, there was a fatal and tragic shark attack at a beach near to where we live here in Sydney, uh, Little Bay, which is near La Perouse, south, south of where we are. Mm -hmm. It was a very shocking, um, horrific, horrific, shocking piece of news for not only for the facts of what what happened but the fact that it was caught on video mm. which if you haven't seen the video you better have some thick skin because it is the mm. most confronting image i mean you, you witness a i've show. seen one there's so, so two there's videos two. surfaced and i'm not going to watch the second one the second one was that was a lot more clear mm. and filmed by a different person from a different angle and it is so, like it is imprinted in my brain right now. I cannot unsee it. And the way it, the way I saw it was it was sent to me in a, in a, like a, a group chat. Is it worth watching? What are the what are the what what's the pro of watching I've been that thinking about that video it. versus the cons? Okay. For, so the way that, that I saw it was it was sent in a group chat and I didn't it wasn't captioned with mm. hey guys it was just a shark attack 5 minutes ago. <clears throat> Sorry. Um so I opened this video and all of a sudden I'm watching a shark attack unfolding. And I didn't know if it was a viral video from years ago or what. Turns out it was the, the moment, maybe half an hour or an hour after it happened. Firstly, it is concerning that people's first reaction is to pull out the phone and film, right? So mm -hmm. the, the, the nature of this particular event was that this guy went for a swim at little bay he swims all the time but describe little bay it, it, it's so it's like a u-shaped yeah it's a it's a typical bay but it's it's nice and cozy and there's rocks it's very that, cozy rocks that run the perimeters mm -hmm. which means that if you're standing on the point where the rocks are you're you're essentially a couple hundred meters have you ever out been to, to that one yeah i have is it it's, it's a beautiful bay it's small though right? it's, it's small it is small yeah. so when you're standing on the rocks like tamarama probably a little bit big, bigger than that okay yeah but still not not that much mm -hmm. bigger you're standing on the rocks, you're 200 meters offshore, so you're kind of out to sea, but you're standing on the land. Mm -hmm. And swimmers like to swim point to point across the bay, rock to rock. Right. And it's very common, lots of people swim there. Mm -hmm. This guy apparently swam there all the time, daily or weekly, I'm not sure. But on this particular day, there was a, a bait ball, which was essentially thousands of, I don't know what the fish was, it could have been salmon, it could have been anything big ball of fish, right, in the bay. Mm. Seagulls and birds were diving to get them. Fishermen were, were throwing their line out. So the, the, the environment was set up that, that you could see there was action in the water. A lot of us know that if there's a bait ball around, there's probably predators that are preying on it. But would, would the swimmer, would he have known? Well, a lot of swimmers sort of recounted their, their t story of that day and they pulled out of their swim. They looked at it, they said, you know what, there's a lot of action out there Maybe we, we shouldn't go out today. Mm. This guy, whether he saw it or not, unfortunately ended up swimming through a bait ball and he got attacked by a great white shark. What you see in the video, I, I don't know if this needs a warning, but can I, can I talk about it? Like the graphics of it? I guess yeah, I'm just if explaining you're, it. If you're in the car with the kids, yeah. this might be a time to pause it. Yeah. So here's, here's the, the little warning. What you see in the video is a shark attack the guy and then you just see his torso floating face down with no arms or legs and just a pool of blood. The water is red. The person filming is talking about what they're seeing and they're explaining it and then the shark comes back and finishes him off, which is 
when do you get to sit? So that mm. because the rocks were and so isn't close, that supposed to not happen. Talk about sharks, right? Why it's biting once, kind of, of realizing, oh, yeah, you know, that's that's not what I thought it was going to be, right? And then taking off, right? That that's what you usually would see. This was the I first. I'm not a shark expert, so I'm not no, sure you're if right. that's uh, uh, reality or just stories. But oh, I think it I've is. Heard. I mean, look, look at the numbers. So that was the first fatal shark attack in 60 years. Every day. Mm. I think this is every day or every year. I'm, I, again, I'm not the facts man like you, Science Hill. <laughs> 10 million people go for a swim, let's say every year. 10 million individuals recurrently. Maybe it's daily, month, whatever, 10 million people. Over 60 years, there's been one attack. So the odds are one in hundreds and hundreds of millions, if not billions, of getting fatally eaten by a shark, okay? Again, shark experts are like, what is this guy talking about? But anyway. Mm. so And also, Drew, yeah. is that... Is that number changing with a changing climate? I can't because, answer that. But you know, there are a whole lot of people that would suggest that the shark's movements right. may be changing. Right. It's possible. I mean, yeah. the, so on this day, the water was 24 degrees, which I apparently, I don't know if that's, I think great whites don't like warm water. It's pretty warm, isn't it's it? very warm. And he was wearing a wetsuit and not many people swim in a wetsuit in 24 degree water. Mm. He was a big guy, apparently, six foot five. So he gets attacked 10 meters from the rocks. So you get a clear video, yeah, but clear it's footage. deep water there. Deep water, I've heard. correct. It drops right off. It does, it drops off a shelf. Um, so this video goes viral. It hits private messages to mm. people. It reaches the news and all of a sudden the headlines are out. This is where you're going to get it off This is where chest. I want to get it off my chest. Okay, it's a big build up. It is a big build up. Thanks Sorry. for the story. I think I needed a bit of a story. So the part I want to get off my chest is the following. Number one, the headlines, obviously, you've got to enrage to engage. We know this. We know that negative headlines make more money, get more eyes, get more views. I understand that. Uh, most people do understand that. There's, I guess it's called like the negative, is it called the negativity bias? Have you heard of that? Yeah. So like you got, imagine you've got a beautiful, colorful salad full of amazing fresh food. One hair can spoil the salad. Mm. Like yesterday was the most amazing rainbow in Bondi. I didn't see any major media covering it. It was incredible. <laughs> I'm going to send you a photo. But you know why? Because of this is what I'm about to explain. One hair can ruin a beautiful salad. We focus on the negative. Mm. But if you had a bowl of hair and a little bit of salad, you're not going to focus on the salad, right? <laughs> That's the rainbow for you. So essentially the headlines were terrible explaining that there was this vicious shark attack, which it was. In no headline or article did I see anything about the actual circumstances of the bait ball, the fishermen, the, the situation, context. the context of it. The part I want to get off my chest is the knee-jerk reaction of the authorities mm. on how they go about this getting of revenge of the shark and call it like locals even were calling for a culling of all mm. sharks in the even area. Even the language of shark attack, I believe some people have been working to change that to shark, shark encounter accident or encounter yeah mm. i mean let's call a spade a spade mm. well i'm going to anyway I'll, I'll put myself out there it the was a shark attack back, though the fact it came back it a, for yeah, seconds yeah but if if a surfer kind of just gets nibbled correct i'm not sure that that's always an attack i agree sometimes that is the shark sussing out that i would call What's a shark happening? encounter that's an encounter if you, if the shark makes the prey its meal to, i mean that sounds sure. like it's a shark attack the yeah, shark i agree with that attacked the the seal human whatever it was and finished it i agree eh? with that as a non-shark expert I we think are you're right. we are so far out of our depths here but anyway this is get off your chest i can talk this about is what this. happens in the proof <laughs> no I, I i promise <laughs> no. that uh the show I, I i one thing that i don't i didn't comment about this is i i don't want um i i want to hold myself accountable Mm. to not start going into other lanes and pretending to be an expert. Agree. You know, I, my thing is nutrition. Agree. I want to explore some of this other other fields. Yes. And do it through a scientific lens. And I think I can use that curiosity to ask some good questions. Yeah. But I don't want to kind of try and be a jack of all No, trends. and we're not trying to be marine biologists here. I'm just explaining what, what my issue is with the, the knee-jerk reaction of the authorities to go and call for a find the shark, cull the shark, or cull sharks in the area. Mm. I think it is so immature and unevolved to think that we it's can ignorant. get revenge on a on a on this animal that is doing what it is designed to do in its environment. It's the apex predator. It doesn't know it did something morally wrong to us. Mm. And I think that we need to understand that every time we enter the ocean, 
And I can say this because I get in the ocean every day of my life. I do an ocean swim every morning, often in the evening as well. When I get into that water, I know that I am going into an ecosystem where there's an apex predator that can kill me. We have to respect that. And every time we get out, practice some gratitude. We got to enjoy the ocean, mm -hmm. be a part of nature and understand that it can be dangerous even though the odds are very slim. I just think that going out and trying to find the – firstly, how are you going to find the shark? You're going to take it in for questioning. Sorry, sir, was it were you the guy who – no. You, we're not going to know which shark it was. What about tagging the sharks? Tagging, I can understand. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure marine biologists – There's an app. Well, right. There's probably many. But I there's think one that's that great. has them tagged and then if you're – uh, swimming or surfing in a certain beach, you'll get an you'll alert. Be aware of sharks. I mean, that's event. great. I, I, f I find that to be a potential solution. It's still pretty invasive. You've mm. got to catch the shark, tag it with whatever they tag it with. Yeah, they use drum lines, I think, to catch them. Right. And and how do they do they sedate them? Do they? I don't understand. Yeah. The actual, so there's, so there's probably some questions there around that practice. The morals of that practice. I think it's certainly better than just culling everything. I mean, think about. Definitely. Imagine you're driving and a a tree falls on a car and kills someone. You don't go cut down all the trees in the area no, just to make you it safe. realize from a uh, just – Odds perspective. Odds perspective. Yeah. That, that's unlikely to happen. Yeah. But also you appreciate that everything has a role exactly. within an ecosystem. And, and sometimes we are going to experience some bad luck. And it's mm. sad and it was horrific and I'm, I didn't want to see it. But it was hard to look away once you start seeing this footage because it's just unbelievable that you get to – no, you don't see this usually. I just think we need to, as human beings, understand that we are not this great, we just intervene all the time with nature and I think we just need to find our place. So there it is. It's off my chest. Thank you for letting me do that. I feel better. And probably just to, to kind of add to that, right now, Lismore and northern New South Wales, mm -hmm. northern rivers, um, southern Queensland has experienced these very devastating floods and... I'm not sure if you've seen it, but I've seen a number of shark experts posting saying, you know, now's the time probably to not be surfing so much, particularly mm. if you're near uh, a river sort of outlet or an in inlet um, with the, all the floods that have occurred and the changes to the river in terms of um, uh, salinity and where, um, you know, different food is, food mm. avail availability for sharks has changed. Mm. And so this might be a time where bull sharks in particular are, you know, floating around some of these surf yeah. spots. I've seen a bit of that online and apparently there have been quite a lot of sightings. Um, so I think for the next little while, yeah, just be, be cautious and understand that the context has changed a bit. Anything for you want to get off your chest or is it was that my segment today? <laughs> Yeah, so I do have something that I'd like to to get off my chest. It doesn't happen that often. Uh, and it actually overlaps with the the next segment that we had, which was new study highlights. It's a bit of a crossover. Hey friends, a quick message from one of our sponsors who make this show possible, and then we'll jump straight back into the episode. If you're familiar with my nutrition philosophy, you will know that I'm a big believer in plant-rich diets being better for people and our planet. You'll also know that I frequently draw attention to what I describe as nutrients of focus. These are nutrients that science shows plant-based eaters, whether plant predominant or exclusive, can fall short on, which can leave you feeling run down, lacking energy, experiencing brain fog, and generally just not as vital as you'd like to be. For that reason, together with a meal, a plant-based health and wellness company, I have formulated Essential 8. Essential 8 is your one-stop multi-nutrient, formulated with DHA, EPA, omega-3s from algae oil, vitamin B12, iodine, vitamin D3, iron, zinc, selenium, and calcium to perfectly complement your plant-rich diet. I personally take Essential 8 every morning with breakfast, just two capsules, much easier than supplementing with these eight key nutrients individually. What's even more convenient is I have a monthly subscription, so it turns up automatically on my doorstep and I never miss a beat. To get yours, head to theproof.com forward slash friends. That's theproof.com forward slash friends, where you'll find a link to purchase Essential 8 that will get you an extra 5% off your first order on top of the significant subscription discount. There will also be a link for this in the show notes. Okay, back to the show. 
So in the last couple of weeks, people may have seen various headlines. I'm not sure if you saw these about meat extending lifespan. <laughs> I didn't see it, but elaborate, please. I saw it and I thought this is going to be good. <laughs> uh, and it was. And, uh, you know, this these headlines, so a few of these headlines I have here uh, in front of me, Channel 9 News said, meat consumption leads to greater life expectancy. I'll, I'll go through some of the problems with these headlines in a minute. Uh, the, the headlines from The Express, which is a UK online uh, media company, said, how to live longer, the surprising food we should all eat. Uh, meeting Place said, and this is quite fitting, Meeting Place, mm. they said, eating meat extends human life expectancy. So just remember that that headline is saying that meat extends human life expectancy is not associated, but actually extends, is responsible causal. for causal. Yeah. Uh, the Daily Mail, obviously they're very trustworthy. Take that with the they, grannies. Yeah. <laughs> they say, Australian study shows eating meat correlates to a longer life. More I responsible. that they wrote the word correlates. Very responsible. Daily Mail. Yeah. Who would have thought? Find that journalist. Imagine that, that <laughs> Daily Mail actually gets a headline. It's still- Half correct. It's still silly. Yeah. And we'll get to why when I get it off my chest, but Channel 9 News didn't even get that. Mm. And that's basic. And mm. then, uh, yeah, the Channel 9 News one, I've already yeah. said that one. Okay. So where did people get the idea that eating meat extends life span? This study here in front of me. So uh, I went through this with a fine tooth comb. I was very interested firstly to see that a bunch of the researchers uh, were actually Australian, uh, from mm -hmm. the University of Adelaide. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, that's why Australian media in particular sort of picked this one up. Mm -hmm. But it did go globally. What, uh, where was it published? What journal? So <laughs> this is a, a fascinating question uh, and not one that we planned. Yeah. But I'm glad you, added, you asked that. So, you know, we... Usually with nutrition type papers, there are five, 10, you know, maybe 15 kind of journals that you see, top journals mm. that you see most of the studies being published in. I had never seen this journal before. Mm -hmm. And it's published by uh, an independent publisher called Dove Press. Mm -hmm. And they, they have a, a few different kind of um, journal titles. This one's the International Journal of General Medicine. What's really interesting and I think important for people to understand, and I'm still going to go into the study and some of the problems with it, mm -hmm. but before we do that, Dove Press is or has been described as a predatory journal. Right. And a predatory journal, um, there are a number of different definitions for them, but largely... Uh, one of the commonalities is that they do not have a stringent peer-reviewed process. Right. They may only have one reviewer. Uh, a lot of the time you can kind of pay to play to get into these journals. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not as uh, sort of stringent as leading journals. In like saying JAMA, that, but in example. saying that, some of the very credible journals have also published studies of, yes. like to so, exonerate meat. And so they're not without... Their, their fault. Mm. Um, but this one journal in particular, Dove Press, and I'll put a link into the show notes, does have a bit of a checkered history. Mm. Um, and again, that's that's not my main gripe with this, this paper. It's yeah. just an interesting thing to kind of uh, note. Okay. So I saw a lot of people online sharing this study. And of, of course, it was mainly coming from the low carb kind of camp. Mm -hmm. And I think to preface this before I go into that, one of, because I always like to look for logical consistency. Yeah. Right. Hold someone to a consistent train of thought, right? Mm -hmm. And and usually if someone's being logically inconsistent, then they're cherry picking evidence to suit a sort of pre uh, preconceived idea or view. Yeah. And so this low carb sort of camp that, that was citing this study, usually they're the first to say that epidemiology is flawed. Right. 
and they'll say things like food frequency questionnaires mm -hmm. are problematic, yep. um, that healthy user bias, you know, things that we've discussed before and I've discussed and yep. there are, um, you know, those things are there, but researchers are aware of their limitations and, and do their best to, to make sure that the, the data is sort of as clean as possible mm -hmm. um, and reduce confounding variables and, and use food frequency questionnaires that are validated, et cetera. That's a whole nother conversation. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that if we go to the sort of evidence hierarchy, mm. this study that got published was, it is a, a form of observational epidemiology of course it is. Okay. So yeah. that's the first thing just to note here. Yeah. But within observational epidemiology, and this is going another layer deeper, yeah. there are certain types of observational ep epidemiology that are more reliable than others. Right. So, for example, a prospective cohort mm -hmm. where we, we go to a population and we enroll them and we at, ba at baseline conduct a, a, a questionnaire and understand what their diets are like. We also get data on alcohol consumption, smoking, education, income, um, uh, physical activity, I'm not sure if I mentioned that, BMI, mm -hmm. all these other uh, parts of their lifestyle uh, or their health that we know will affect health outcomes so that later we can adjust for them right. and try and reduce their effects so we can see the independent effect that diet has. Right. And uh, so we enroll in a prospective cohort study actual people in a population and follow them over time, repeat those measurements over time. Mm -hmm. That's that's a, a more reliable uh, type of observational design. Mm -hmm. And then you have cross-sectional studies, but that again may enroll like actual humans mm -hmm. into these studies, but it's one time point. Mm -hmm. So if we get people in, we take all these measurements, we look at their diet and we look at their health at one time point. Mm -hmm. But it's because it doesn't have the temporal aspect, it's very hard to understand what came first. Okay. You know? it's, it's sort of like what I was saying before with if a system's in dynamic flux and you just get a snapshot, yes. it doesn't tell you so all that So a cross-sectional study is just a snapshot at one point in time, yep. um, but it doesn't give you any sort of uh, idea or it, it doesn't give you as good a, an idea about the relationship between variables as a prospective cohort uh, and then a step better again is a clinical intervention. Gotcha. Um, and so remember that cross-sectional is a snapshot. Mm -hmm. Now, a step down below- Oh, I thought that's below where- Below that <laughs> is ecological okay. type of studies. And that's what this is. So you would think that this paper that's been widely cited is at least looking at a population. Right. And I have data on how much uh, meat Drew ate, yep. and I have data on how much meat Drew's mum ate right. and Drew's sister, right. and I also know what Drew's health's like. It's none of that. <laughs> okay, so this is an ecological study. The researchers essentially looked at the supply of meat in various countries okay. via the FAO, so there's a database. This is looking at meat supply, not intake, okay, I see because there's also this. food loss. Um, but then they just averaged it by the population, right? which is pro a huge problem straight away because we know that meat consumption is not the same throughout the population. There are certain people that have low meat intake, certain right. people that have moderate, mm -hmm. certain people that have high intake. And when you just take an average, you know, you lose that straight away, yeah. right? Yeah. They also at the at the um, so there's no people enrolled in this study. Right, you're not actually understanding. So they're looking at a supply, and they're extrapolating that to 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 say that, well, humans must be eating it, and this is how much they're eating. But and then really, we don't average. Know, we don't know that at all. Right, and then also with life expectancy, that's that's also an average. Right, um, as opposed to if you look, you know, at a more detailed sort of prospective cohort study. Let's pretend we have Bill and Betty, yep. right? And within a, a given population, Bill is consuming um, you know, more red meat than Betty and uh, Bill you know, lives till 70 and Betty lives till 80. Mm -hmm. With the data that they have, they've just averaged their life expectancy and averaged their gotcha. meat intake. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. You see the problem with that? I, I see the problem. So... That's, that um, seems so 
elementary. Like, you, I just can't believe that that is even something anyone would cite. Yeah. So that this is just it, honestly reading through this paper. It's one of the worst papers I've read. Yeah. Um, and I don't say that lightly. There's yeah. a lot of problems in here. Uh, on top of that, uh, they 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 do try and factor in, or they say they do, sort of socioeconomic status, mm-hmm. which is really important. Because coming back to what I was saying earlier, with any observational study, you need to consider what other variables might be affecting, in this case, lifespan. Right. And let's try and adjust for them mm-hmm. so that what we're seeing as best as possible is just the effect of meat mm-hmm. on lifespan. Right. And so this, this study had 175 countries in it. And what they did is they just adjusted for the country's GDP. Mm. Right. But again, this is not granular enough, mm. right? Because think about it. What that's doing is it's, uh, if, we, if we take Australia, for example, right? Everyone that is Australian that lives in Australia is living in a country that has the same GDP. They're all Australian, yep. right? But you have low socioeconomic areas right. and high socioeconomic areas. Mm-hmm. Uh, an example of this might be if we take people in America uh, and we just compare people living in Hollywood which is in a city to people living in Detroit, which is also in a city, but one's high socioeconomic, one's low socioeconomic. We know that people that are living in, in higher socioeconomic um, parts of the country also have uh, higher education, higher income, access better to access healthcare. to healthcare. Yep. And all of that is very associated with lifespan. Yep. So the study just is not granular enough mm. at all. It's to, not controlling for the confounding factors that and it's just taking these massive averages. Okay. What's what's way what would be a much better study is go and look at a particular population and get into that population and split people by their meat intake. So quintiles. Mm-hmm. So you have these five different groups of, you know, very low to no meat intake, a little bit, and you go up to high. Mm-hmm. And then you also know all of those people, their BMI, their income all of these, you know, socioeconomic factors yep. and you can adjust for all of that and then just very specifically look at how differences in meat intake affects lifespan. And we have those studies, right? And we do have those studies. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, across the board, a number of these I wrote about in my book, you see swapping animal protein for plant protein increases or, or sorry, um, decreases uh, total mortality. So you're, you know, increasing... Um, lifespan, yep, so to speak, by and, doing and that, it's probably health span too, yeah, yeah. And those are those are associations because those are our cohort studies. Sure. So that's an association that we see, but it is consistent across different populations mm. uh, across the world. And also, just one little point here that I think is is worth um, kind of adding is this is you know this this study looked at 175 countries across the world yeah. it's one of the problems with just comparing different countries because people are so different mm. it's far better for example people often say well in hong kong they're eating a lot of meat and there's a, a, a few interesting things to think about that because hong kong they do have a high life expectancy mm-hmm. they also have one of if not the best healthcare access in the world right. um but <laughs> What would be really interesting, and I haven't seen a study do this, is go into Hong Kong Mm -hmm. where you have a group of people who all have the same healthcare access, you know, are living very similarly, Mm -hmm. split them into different meat intakes and then look at their different health outcomes. Right. Um, So just something to kind of keep in mind there. But all in all, you know, this study was super weak Mm. and it was, you know, interesting to see that certain headlines, including Adelaide University, yeah. saying that meat extends lifespan. Look, the, the only good news I can pull out of that is that the news cycle is very short and those headlines will hopefully be forgotten <laughs> within 24, 48 hours. Times times change, people move on. But I understand the frustration there, especially when you someone like yourself who really honours scientific process and the, and the role of science mm-hmm. in, in public health, um, you know, messaging. And to get something so just cheap and weak like that Mm. to get shared so rapidly as well. That's the problem, man. Like going back to the the, the shark story I was saying is that the ability to share this information is so instantaneous. Click of a button, it's out there. You can have a misleading headline that gets to people and then they just, it just proliferates. 
they shared with their their family and then before you know it people believe these these headlines and don't understand how to critically analyze the background of how this comes to to be yeah so if you're uh listening I think the take-home message here from a scientific point of view is when you see a headline that seems to conflict so much evidence that's out there, mm. that's always a, a reason to it's – it's a little bit of an alarm yeah. bell, mm. right? Because we're looking for converging lines of evidence. The one new study that comes out doesn't just debunk a whole mm. <laughs> you know, body of research. Yeah. And what you can see in this case is that you know, actually the findings in this study – even though they're odds with so much research, they're explainable. Mm. We can look at what are some of the limitations with this type of research and then we can look at the evidence hierarchy and we can sort of walk away saying this is not an anomaly. Mm. It's just a very weak type of science, you know, and we don't, we don't expect that such a design to get, it would ever give us a really good indication as to how meat affects lifespan. And we move on and we move up the hierarchy and we look to studies that are more robust mm. and they're all pointing in that direction of swapping calories from animal protein for plant protein yep. being of benefit and that's a, a very consistent finding. The problem is for the lay person who doesn't understand what the larger body of evidence actually says, like what the consensus position is, these little headlines form their decision making. So if they don't, they don't even have a reference point to bounce this off. They just go, "Oh wow, it turns out eating meat improves your life expectancy. Better start adding and, some more in." I mean, particularly if you like meat, because confirmation bias right. will get you there. Right. You know, and you'll see that headline, and if you do, if you're looking for something right. to tell you that your meat consumption is good, yeah. then you might end up sharing this article yeah. or this paper, even though it's very, very, very weak yeah. in terms of science. This makes me think of, of a reason why, and I'm not saying that we should always appeal to authority, but a reason why we should at least lean on the consensus positions mm -hmm. around nutrition and science, because I imagine, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the consensus position is looking at the totality of evidence and the larger body of evidence. It so is. that when these things float around, they, they barely even cause a dent because there's so much evidence pointing in the other direction. Mm -hmm. So listening to the health authorities and public health messaging from these con just a consensus positions is probably a wise move to make with a grain of skepticism and critically mm -hmm. thinking through, you know, how things can change. But jumping on a study without even taking a step back and going, well, what, is, what are all of the experts really saying? That's probably a wise thing to do, right? To sort yeah. of look at- And just understand that that consensus is very, very slowly shaped over decades. Right. It doesn't just bounce around and one new study comes out and changes the whole <laughs> consensus. Yeah. You know, science is, there's constantly new questions and, and new answers, but they're usually very small pieces of the puzzle. And if anything's changing, it's very slow. Mm. So, um, you know, again, if something is- in the headlines, which seems to be at odds with everything else you hear. Mm. Sure, you know, there might be that temptation just to kind of accept it. Yeah. We've all been there. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, um, but I think just be critical. Yeah, for sure. Were there any co conflicts of interest from the authors? Like, um, Not that I, disclaimed? I didn't really do a, okay. a thorough uh, sort of search. Like background nothing that Nothing that was, was uh, published. Okay. All right. How do you feel? You got it off your chest? I feel good. It's a good segment, right? Yeah. It's great. Good. We've got to keep this this theme happening. I think just for us, they're not going to do it with all your guests because you never know. Yeah, what I think it's probably gonna... just just with us. Okay. But I, I I think it's good, and uh, um, you know I think where possible, um, it's it's better to keep it to the science and the study. Mm. Uh, you know, I know that it can get a little more personal when you're bringing up names. I think True. it's okay to bring up names, but at the end of the day, um, what I'm most interested in is not the person that has a claim or why they're sharing certain information, but the actual claim, the content, what does the science show right. and how can we make sense of it? Is it a, a genuinely good claim and right. a bit of science that we need to look at and update our thinking? Yeah. Or, um, you know, is it is it a, a silly, uh, <laughs> silly claim? <laughs> Get it of, off your there's chest. There's a lot of those going claims. around. No, but you, you're right. And I think that using people or, or, you know, headlines as an example is actually really eye-opening. And I mean, this does lead into the next part that we were going to do, which is sort of like a silly, a silly Instagram social media post of mm. the week, because let's be honest, they're 
everywhere. Like it is so, you would think that it would, when you said to me, hey, like, is there a, is there a social media post that sort of floated around lately that you want to talk about that was a bit silly or, or, or something to have a little bit of a laugh? Because we want a bit of sense of humor here. Um, you would think it would be very hard to choose because there's so much BS on social media. Did you find one? So easily. <laughs> like it was, it was instant. I knew exactly what it was. It was not a hard process at all, which is saying Had something. Had you already seen it or did you think? I'd seen it, but okay. it just came to mind just right. str straight away. It might be the most absurd oh, gosh. of all time. Drum roll. Should we just, should we do it? Should we get into it? Yeah. Let's, let's knock it out. And then we can finish with good news of the week. Sure. L end on a high. Okay. <laughs> okay. So when Science Hill asked me to bring in a piece of social media, uh, like a post or, or any caption or something that would essentially come across as silly or absurd, it, this was the easiest assignment he could have ever given me. So here it is. I love that you uh, you have made up that this was a segment of the show that I've introduced because I'm pretty sure. <laughs> was this mine? I'm pretty sure. Maybe initially. <laughs> was it? Yeah. Oh, and then well, maybe I followed you up. I can't remember. Whatever. Let's go. But this seems like you. This does sound like me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So True, here we go. You, and you already had this saved, I reckon. I didn't have it saved. I had to go find it and screenshot it for this. Okay. Just saying. Um, now, do I name the person? Because this person, they put out a public post. They chose to do this because I don't want to seem like I'm this guy on a mission to, on a yeah, crusade. We're kind of setting the rules now because this is the first, first time, time we're doing this. I'm, 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 I'm okay with naming. Okay. Um, probably not shaming. Okay. No, so he's, you're right. You're, I think I, I think we can keep it respectful you're right. whilst speaking to what they were saying. What we are going to do is deconstruct what we're reading, what we're seeing why it's silly without, we're not attacking the individual or anything else about this person other than what they chose mm. to put out to the public. And I, which I think is one of the most irresponsible, misleading, untrue Instagram posts wow. that, in the nutrition space that I've seen in a long time. That's big. I wasn't the only one who thought this. The comment section erupted. I checked Was it. Was I in there? Yeah, of course you were. <laughs> we're always in those sections. <laughs> it's been fun, you know. People, people tag us in. and I know. But also I, I think... Just interestingly, talking about what's wrong with these sort of things in the comments section is is part of the learning curve of of people who are reading the comments, right? Yeah. So they they look through the comments and they go, "Hey, look what Simon said about or Science Hill said about this. Look what Drew said. Look what these people said." It allows you to to sort of broaden the aperture about mm -hmm. maybe the content in this post isn't as truthful or good as it seems on the outside. So I think the comment section. Just it's a it's a way to engage, start the conversation, and communicate responsibly. And and mm. we're never. Was there a lot of comments on this? I think over over three thousand, maybe. Gosh, it, it went big. Yeah, that hit the algorithm. It, That's it, why people do this. Exactly. But this is this is. I mean, this wasn't even meant to be the get off your chest segment, but it's sort of leading into it. Let me get into it. That so, didn't hit the algorithm. I should say that that worked well. Correct with the algorithm. It did. It went viral. It was a viral post, um, but for the wrong reason. And I would rather... However, do you think when someone sees engagement like that, mm. that, they're, that they're sort of reinforced to take that angle again? Yeah. As a content sure. creator. Of course, it's, it's going to reinforce that sort of negativity, mm. ruffle the feathers style of post. However, as an authentic individual, I would prefer to have a hundredth of the likes and engagement and actually influence people in a positive way mm. rather than reaching millions of people and having a very negative effect on most of them. So I'm going to get into it. So the, I mean, I'm gonna, I could name him. I could say his name rhymes with <laughs> Dr. Levin Sin. <laughs> okay. Oh, so we're doing, are we rhyming names? No, nah, we're doing it. His name is Dr. Stephen Lin. And this was the post. Okay, so the, the image was written content and it says the following. Real talk. Firstly, I don't like when, when a post starts with real talk because that, that just implies that all your other posts are fake talk. What is this? Fake news? Real, whatever. Real talk. Fruits aren't that healthy. Fructose, the sugar found in fruit, acts like a slow poison in the body, like alcohol. Poison. Poison. Fruit. Like alcohol. It gets worse. In small doses, your liver can clear it. In excess, the liver spews fat. 
into the bloodstream like in alcoholics. Very emotional. Spews the fat, okay? Picture a liver just spewing fat out. You just ate your banana. After you've had a handful of berries. You just had the berries, okay? If you eat too much, in brackets, three pieces is too much, okay? Three pieces. Not one, not two, three pieces. Anything after that, your I'll go back to the quote, your body swiftly evacuates the fructose from the digestive system. Fruit should be seen as a dessert, full stop. Okay. I'll give him a 10 out of 10 for so that, the creative writing. So that's, the, that's the image, a dessert, like chocolate cake. Sure. So is there a caption as well? There's a caption. So that's like a tweet that's been screenshot and been posted on Instagram. That's How correct. How do you feel about that? I mean- the, the kind of Twitter- Instagram overlap. Oh, like I infiltrating. Yeah. Well, um, it's, they, it's, they do seem to to get a fair bit of engagement. They do. I do think the Twitter sphere is is far darker than mm. than Instagram in general. Yeah. And I'd rather it not be there. I'd like the consumer to be able to choose what platform and how dark they want to get. Yeah. Um, like the comment sections in Twitter is just mm. name calling and bullying. Mm. Whilst not, I don't even use Twitter. I don't even know this. I'm just saying this is what people have told me. Um, but in Instagram, I feel like it can be a little bit more positive. Like if you if you design your Instagram feed for positivity, it can be beautiful. I've really cleared mine out. I just see puppy dogs, surfing, things that I want to act and control your environment. You control your environment. Anyway, back to the post. So here's the caption. But then, how did you see this? Uh, I was tagged mm. by can't control everything, can you? And you and I, we keep getting tagged in posts that sort of defend carbohydrates because sure. and plants, which is a, I understand why because mm. we have strong opinions about it. Caption, I'm not trying to tell you to stop eating fruit. Well, you just <laughs> said kind it was of a poison yeah, you just, <laughs> and it, you, your body was going to spew fat. I'm trying to give the truth about it so you can make your own decision. Truth seekers. Okay. So I'm not telling you to stop, but if you keep doing it, it's going to kill you. That's basically what he's saying. And then he says, actually, reframe that. I'd say fruit smoothies aren't a good idea. I've been having one every day for three years since going plant-based. My blood sugar control has been fabulous. I feel amazing. I love it. It's delicious. Anyway, apparently it's not a good idea. Maybe I should stop. Let's find out. The standard claim, so the caption goes on. The standard claim is that fruits are full of fiber and phytonutrients. Are they not, Simon? That's a fairly accurate claim. Very accurate. Okay, so that is an accurate claim. Just checking. Well, yes, berries have resveratrol, bananas have potassium, oranges, vitamin C, and others, but these aren't in any impressive amount that can be obtained elsewhere, that can't be obtained elsewhere. They also don't outweigh some of the downsides of eating fruit in the modern world. Okay, what are these downsides? Let's let's read on. We are a population that has been flooded in sugar and metabolic disease for three generations. Our guts, metabolisms, taste buds, and brains have been taught that sugar is okay. Notice how people get real defensive of fruit, he says. Yeah, they do get defensive of fruit because it's very healthy and the, the vast majority of evidence mm. tells you that the more fruit you eat, you're probably going to be healthier, live longer, have Has less disease. Has got any evidence that says that no, fruit no. increases your risk of type 2 diabetes, no, of, of obesity, not. or of living a shorter life? Of, of course not, because I don't think that that is what the evidence so says. So what evidence does he have to support any of this? None, but, but it's, it's, it's just storytelling. So we'll, we'll carry on. I mean, sorry, but before we carry on, the reason people get defensive of fruit is because they are def- defending a position that has been established by quality science. And from their experience, not only do they enjoy eating fruit, so he's demonizing not only a fu- an individual food, but an entire macronutrient, carbohydrate and sugars, right? I have a real problem with that. I will keep reading. Per capita, fructose consumption has increased 100 fold over the last century. Epidemiological studies suggest that excessive fruit fructose consumption Links to non-alcoholic, alcoholic, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, obesity, and diabetes. He's getting mixed up right there with high fructose corn syrup. Thank you. And ultra processed foods versus fructose that is found in fruit. So, so what he's done is he's reduced the food to a molecule, mm. which is fructose, and not looked at the the matrix, how it's packaged with I'd everything love else. To see a a study that shows fruit consumption increases the risk of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease would right. be interesting. Well, or any study that shows eating fruit impairs liver function. Right. So, I mean, just to hammer that home again, fructose, the sugar found in fruit, is very different physiologically when we consume it compared to fruit, which is the full package. Mm. They're just so different. He goes on. 
Just like alcohol, excessive consumption of fructose can be toxic to the liver. For the most part, the metabolic pathway for the body to break down fructose is in the liver. When large quantities of fructose reach the liver, it uses excess fructose to create fat, a process called lipogenesis, which by the way, I'm just gonna add in here, lipogenesis is a pretty inefficient process, right? Mm. Like there's an energy cost. So the body, why would the body just throw waste energy, like 30% of the energy that comes in from, from converting that molecule into fat, converting sugar to fat? It just doesn't make sense, even evolutionary, uh, from an evolution, evolutionary lens. Why would the body just waste energy mm. turning sugar to fat? But, oh, carry and, on. And, and to be honest, there's clinical intervention studies that have fed humans, looked at diets, feeding, you know, adding saturated fat to diets, adding refined carbohydrates, including fructose to diets, right. and looking at the hepatic fat, right. how much fat is building up in yeah. the liver. And the, there's a big review that was published in Nature last year, I'll put this into the links, that shows when you're, when you're eating uh, a diet that's rich in either saturated fat or refined carbohydrates, and you're at uh, maintenance level, right? That um, saturated fat will increase hepatic fat mm. if you have a diet that's rich in saturated fat, right. even if you're at maintenance. Right. So you're not in, in an excess, gotcha. right? Whereas refined carbohydrates, and look, I'm not a proponent for ultra processed foods Nor that are I. full of refined carbs, but very interestingly, unless it was a diet that provided an excess of calories, refined carbohydrates, when someone was eating a diet at their maintenance level of calories, mm. did not increase hepatic fat. Right. So this is this is opposite of what he's saying. Right. And in many ways suggests that if anything, your diet should be really low in saturated fat if you're most worried about hepatic fat and liver function. Well said. The post is nearly over. Let me just finish this off. Eventually, people who consume too much fructose can develop non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, a condition which too much fat is stored in the liver cells. We even have defense systems to stop fructose from reaching the liver. Uh, sorry, one sec. Wait a minute. After one consumes food or a beverage containing fructose, the gut helps to shield the liver from damage by breaking down the sugar before it reaches the liver. Researchers have induced fatty liver in mice by knocking out the enzyme that breaks fructose down in the gut. Just quickly on that on that line. Again, can we extrapolate extrapolate a mice model to human beings? No, it's interesting. And and look, don't. There, there are elements of truth to these posts, so that's the right? Thing. And this is what happens. There's, there's a whole lot of, um, I think, um, big leaps happening here. Yeah. So from first of all, from animal study, just to presuming this happens in humans. Right. But also like a small um, mechanism. thinking about high fructose corn syrup right. and fructose being consumed in ultra processed foods that are stripped of fiber, water, and phytochemicals versus fructose that's occurring naturally yeah. in fruit. Yeah, and uh, I actually have an upcoming episode with a, a scientist, Doctor. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to forget his name, Richard Johnson, mm -hmm. uh, and he his career has been looking at fructose metabolism right. and looking at oh, liver great. health. Great. So, and he's he's released a book recently. Uh, so if there's anyone that's going to help us clear this up, Excellent. it's going to be him. And and I can tell you, he's certainly not anti fruit. Right. Okay. Um, he finishes off by saying excess fructose causes it to spill over into the liver where our body has to struggle to break it down and where it causes fatty liver. We all have fructose spillover. So maybe think about that piece of fruit like an alcoholic drink. <laughs> he then says, okay, that might be a bit far, but the truth is I don't let my kids eat fruit. I can't justify it. Why burden their liver? So... If he is implying that a piece of fruit is like an alcoholic drink, it is. I just find that to be the most irresponsible, ridiculous claim in a, in a world where we need people eating more fruit, mm -hmm. not less, so they can improve their health, to demonize fruit and then say in a way that then if you do uh, feed your kids fruit, then that's child abuse. You know, you know what I mean? Like I just, how he ends with the truth is I don't let my kids eat fruit. So, so what does that say about the people that read this and they do have kids mm -hmm. who eat fruit every day? maybe three, four pieces, berries, bananas, mangoes, whatever. I just, I just don't like that people can put out this information with very, very small grains of like mechanistic truth and then extrapolate it 
and make people feel like they, they need to rethink their, their diet. I would just directly ask Stephen to present any study, preferably clinically, is it, all of the epidemiology shows that fruit's beneficial. I'm pretty sure in the diabetes realm that there's an inverse relationship there between is. fruit and, t- yeah. and type 2 diabetes. So people who eat more fruit. There's even studies looking at pet fruit consumption up to 20 serves a day. Really? Um, wow. And and I would I would then encourage, you know, the, given the observational research is all pointing in that direction. Yeah. You know, present a, a clinical intervention trial that has fed humans fruit, maybe different numbers of serves, mm. and looks at liver function. Is probably is, I'm sure there's studies. And just present that. a study that shows that fruit increases liver fat, mm. uh, and and we can look at it. Yeah, I'm I'm sure those studies exist. We should have looked beforehand, but anyway. So that for me was the silliest claim ever. Um, that's going to be hard to top. However, the internet is a funny place. It might be topped <laughs> tomorrow. <Yeah. laughs> Who knows? Uh, and yeah, just to round that out, I'll put the review to the the Nature review. That I mentioned into the show notes. Mm. That's probably the most comprehensive review that I've read yeah. on different nutrients and fatty liver um, disease, non-alcoholic, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. If people want to read a bit more about what trials have been done. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure I have a, a silly claim or post this week. Yep. I do have a podcast that uh, I haven't listened to in entirety yet. Mm-hmm. It's one of those ones that's t- it's very hard to listen to. Yeah, this is uh, a Joe Rogan podcast with Diana Rogers mm-hmm. uh, and Rob Wolf, and they're you know very low carb, animal based kind of folks. And uh, I was interested to hear what they had to say, mm-hmm. particularly because I did ask Diana for a reference once on Instagram and immediately was blocked. Uh, so if this gets back to you, Diana, I would, <laughs> At least I would love to have a chat yeah. with, with her. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure if that's going to happen. Uh, but, you know, I think it's, 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 there's too much in this episode to go through one claim that mm. I would disagree with. Uh, so I, I will at some stage go through the entire episode mm. and look at sort of claim by claim, um, what's being said, what, what is the best evidence that we have? Um, because a number of people have sent me this episode mm. and I, you know, I think that such episodes, uh, just like headlines are going to continually pop up. So, you know, hopefully going through and reviewing it will be, uh, <laughs> a worthwhile, yeah. uh, exercise, albeit very time consuming, but mm. Uh, I'm going to do that and add that to my list. I think one thing just from listening in, in, in the first sort of 30 minutes or 45 minutes was this very zooming in on a nutrient in a food mm-hmm. and believing that, well, because food X is high in nutrient X, it must be healthy for us. Mm-hmm. And this type of nutrition thinking mm. really goes back to the ni- early 1900s and when it made sense to focus on single isolated nutrients people had uh, nutrient deficiency diseases were the diseases of the day scurvy yeah. vitamin c mm-hmm. you know beriberi pellagra rickets from mm-hmm. vitamin, uh, vitamin d and so of course in the early 1900s when there the diseases of the day were these uh, you know either infectious diseases or these nutrient deficiency related diseases, uh, not these chronic overconsumption style diseases. It made sense. Let's focus on these more isolated nutrients. Mm -hmm. But then as nutrition science has evolved and health has changed, and then, you know, the circumstances we're in today, we're faced with a lot of different diseases. Nutrition has evolved to zoom out, not be so reductionist Mm -hmm. and look at how foods affect health outcomes and then even further out, how do dietary patterns Mm. affect health outcomes? And I feel like they went right into the weeds and it never came back out and and looked at that. So uh, that's, you know, one kind of small I mean, that's that's similar themes to to what I just read out was that reductionism of foods into nutrients. Which we often do see. Yeah. You know, it's a way to kind of distort, create some hyperbole, Mm. 
um, a very reductionist view of something. We saw it with lectins. Yep. Yeah. Um, and uh, we all just need to remember when there, when if you do spot something and it is zooming right in, you know, it it does pay to zoom back out. Yeah, and and I think that if you start to look, to notice this, you'll see that there's almost always some telltale signs and similarities between these posts and that you can sort of flag it early and go, mm. hey, I've seen this before. It'll raise an eyebrow initially. It's like one thing is responsible for all of the poor health. Correct. That's usually a red flag. And it's usually, I have the solution. I have the solution. They lied to you. Yes. I have the truth. That's truth right. Truth seekers. Correct. A lot of this kind of hyperbole, yeah. um, very emotive style language. That's it. Is it's alarm bells? Yeah, and and when when you know if you were to say interview one hundred experts in nutrition, mm. if one person has a very strong belief that goes against the ninety nine, that's probably saying something that there's a deeper motive than you know what that person's really talking about, and that they might be missing the mark sure. there. And I, you know, just speaking of Joe Rogan, I think that i'm actually a big fan of joe rogan i know he's in the headlines Likewise. at the moment and he, he i find him very entertaining i laugh at what he says i love his guests who are i think you can be a fan of him and without agreeing with him sure absolutely like, like you can be a friend yeah. to someone right. who of course you're not going to agree on everything exactly you can still be friends right i i actually i really like him i find him entertaining uh, I, I in particular i like the comedians he has on and the interesting people he has a fantastic um, amount of guests that he gets on from all walks of life. It's incredible. I think where he goes wrong is he if he were to get, say, those other 99 experts on those controversial topics, we might see a very different story being being portrayed. And I think he just picks, he does cherry pick, you know, one or two of those controversial figures mm. who, who's, you know, goes viral and it infiltrates social media and headlines and all of a sudden he's, you know, mm. getting a spotlight sh shine on him and he's in trouble but he has started to balance that out. Where he's in a hard position is that even if he does have guests with, so he has, you know, someone on with a more extreme view and then someone who's more balanced, mm. the extreme view episode gets shared more. Correct. It gets amplified more. Right. Often. And it's a false equivalence in that it's like a 50-50 split. It's like, here's an extreme view, here's a consensus view, which one's right? But if you see the other 99 consensus views behind that guy, all of a sudden the scale is tipped. Mm -hmm. Now you have the one extreme view to every hundred of the other view. So it doesn't actually give you a ratio of how many people have this extreme view like guest A and how many have the consensus view like guest B. I think that's a false equivalence. It's probably an issue, but I've noticed him trying to, he's trying to balance it. Like I have a climate scientist who's controversial followed by one who's more of a sort of co conventional mm -hmm. or conservative view. Um, and it's, it's good. I think it's good to see. We want to hear both sides of the story. And I think that I think you know, he everyone wants to. Yeah, you know, most importantly, I do. I do think he wants to hear different ideas. Yeah, um, he also lo loves a, a conspiracy. They're interesting. Sure. They're entertaining. I, I entertain them, but I certainly don't live my life <laughs> by the the principles of these conspiracies. Sure. Anyway, so folks can can keep an eye out on the socials. I'll let people know or announce on the podcast when I've done that review of that episode uh, in in full. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, I would love to sit down with Diana. Yeah, uh, I'd love to have her on the show. That's awesome. I've, I've uh, invited her before, mm. but um, no luck so far. Okay. So we've got two more segments to go through, good news of the week, and then any interesting books, movies, documentaries, or podcasts. Yep. Let's do the good news. Okay. Uh, sadly, it, I sound like such a pessimist at the moment, but but sadly, the world is, is really, it's hard to find good news right now. Mm. Like, let's be honest. There's, you know, right now in, 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 in Australia, we have some, horrific flooding we had the shark attack two weeks ago we've got these communities that are now underwater animals and people uh, are losing their homes and and their possessions and dying in some cases just dying correct the government aren't doing the best job of helping with this rescue we have, we're seeing civilians doing most of the rescuing which is it's unheard of feels like it's a, a little slow it's, it's, it's a bit slow Whilst they were almost like we weren't prepared enough, we weren't prepared, and also when you contrast it to the rapidness of their response to COVID, they got army on the streets trying to tell people to mm -hmm. stay inside. When you look at that and then see people flooding, uh, you know, the communities are flooding, and then the government and police and army aren't there, it's a bit concerning. It'd be interesting to hear a politician speak candidly about that. I doubt you'll see that. I don't think you'll see that. But um, 
you know, we've got the Russia-Ukraine crisis. It's just the world right now, there's a lot of bad news and it's hard to find good news. But like I said earlier, I have recrafted my Instagram feed to present me with good news. And I did find a nice global survey that popped up on a good news feed where the headline was, new global survey shows that 75% of people want single-use plastic banned. Uh, this survey included, I think it was 20,000 people across 100 and something countries. I'm trying to find some good news here. And I think that to know that, th you know, three quarters, three, three out of four people do agree that single-use plastic mm -hmm. should be banned. It just shows that we are environment focused, that people are more awake than they used to be maybe a few years ago in saying that. Walk into Harris Farm on any given day and you'll see people putting a single apple in a plastic bag and then a single banana in a plastic bag and, it, you know, that sort of grinds my gears a little bit. But I do think that this survey does restore some faith in humanity. Are, um, all the, are some of those bags compostable and where do you stand on that? Because some of them have the green logo that says yeah, I've you know, seen bio-friendly. Unfortunately, the ones at Harris Farm are just plastic bags. Mm. And they, they ban well, plastic I know bags. Luke Harris, so okay. Luke, oh, great. If you're listening. Well, you can call him up. Come this. on, mate. <laughs> um, Let's change I, that up. The funny thing is, is that they banned um, plastic bags at checkout, yet they provide plastic bags for individual pieces of fruit and, and vegetables. So easy to grab a box. Or a Usually there's boxes at, at checkout. Or a I guess it depends on how much you're loading up. But most no, people at Harris Farms are probably only a couple of bags. No, but it's not even about the box. It's, it's that when they're walking around with a little trolley. Mm. No, grab the box before. Oh, but you can. Trick. But, but the point is, you can put your apples and bananas straight in the trolley. You Why, could. They don't have to be in a plastic bag, right. and then you put them in a box yeah. and you leave. So what or bring I your would own. Do bring your own is, bag. Is yeah, bring your own bag. Or a lot of grocery stores, at least here, yeah, it's in Australia, uh, you can as you take your trolley and find the empty boxes. That's true. And just put your put it produce in. straight into that. That's true. But I guess to know that people are waking up to the fact that single use plastic is an issue. Um, but but I, I have been seeing a very concerning amount of disposable masks in the ocean every day with, that I swim. And I encourage people, if you see it, obviously pull off those the little ear pieces because animals get stuck in those and then bin it. And I, yesterday I must have been 15 of them. Um, so Probably the, with the floods, there's probably a whole lot of other true. stuff. There's a um, runoff from the roads and the it moment. just ends up in the ocean. But I guess let's just see people being more connected to their values and make sure their actions align. That would be good to see. What happened with the coffee cup uh, sort of um, project initiative mm. in Bondi? Oh, the BYO I, cup. I was in America, yeah. I think, just shortly after that started. Yeah, it went ahead. So we had, I think it was one week of cafes signing up and jumping on board to basically say, we are against coffee cups. We stand for reusable cups. So either bring your own or dine in and drink your coffee. It takes five minutes. You don't have to have a takeaway cup every single time you drink your coffee in the morning. A lot of cafes jumped on board in Bondi and then it actually beautifully expanded to the Northern Beaches and other areas. And I think it was, you know, very impactful. There were a few cafes here that didn't jump on board and a bit disappointing. My local cafe where I get my coffee every morning. Um, they didn't do it. They didn't. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to call them out on this. I, I don't think that's fair. They have their own reasons. One of the reasons that makes it difficult was because of COVID. They didn't want to be handling other people's cups mm -hmm. at the risk of spreading sure. COVID. I understand that. Um, yeah, so they, they I'm not judging. To, uh, they don't want to get shut down. Yeah, because and as they, soon as it correct. back then when there was a, a COVID, uh, you know, someone got positive, they would have they to close their doors. Back, you'd have to close your. Cafe. I mean. I understand. And the cafes were business. doing it hard enough. Absolutely. That's why there was no judgment there. It was just a little disappointing. But it was really nice to see people who usually would be just using a single-use cup mm. day after day spend 20, 30 bucks on a, on a reusable. And maybe develop a new habit. And a new habit. That's right. So I thought that was a great campaign. That was really good to see. So there's some more good news. Thanks for reminding me about that. Cool. I don't have any good news for the week, so uh, <laughs> I we, don't blame you. Should we? <laughs> Times uh, are tough. I will. I will try yeah. and uh, and bring some good news. No, that's all right. Next time we do this, that's all right. Um, but yeah, it's a little strange with um, the floods, particularly at uh, the moment. I know. I mean, there's there's yeah, a lot of sad news around the world at the moment. But I, I think that at times like this, sometimes I, I get really like kind of nihilistic. Like the world's going, we're all just going to die one day. What's the use? Kind of thing, and then. I've quickly flipped that into, I don't know if this is a term, but I, I think it is like optimistic nihilism where it's like, 
we only get one life here. The world is actually a beautiful place. Let's bloody live it as best we can. And I've been trying to just talk myself out of these negative ruts and just remind myself that this is a beautiful place and it might be a little bit of a mess right now, but I think we can solve these problems. You know, we created them. I think we can solve them. I still love my life. I love this planet we're on. And I think we just need to remember that even when times are really tough, just to understand that it probably is going to turn turn the corner and we only have a short life. So let's live it. Let's enjoy it. Let's do the best we can. As Ryan Holiday would say, the obstacle is the way. There we go. Nice. Uh, Philosophical. And that brings us to books, yep. movies, documentaries, or podcasts. Do you want me to go first? Go for it. Yeah. So a book that I thought was interesting was Toxic, speaking of toxins, uh, by Richard Flanagan. Mm -hmm. He is an Australian journalist. He wrote a book going down to Tasmania and documented the ins and outs of the Tasmanian Atlantic salmon farming which from a marketing point of view would sort of have you told that this is pristine waterways, you know, the best of the best. And unfortunately, what he has documented and, and covered in this book that was published by Penguin is the disastrous effects that that industry is having on both the local ecosystem, but also on the Amazon, on fisheries uh, around the world, um, because the salmon are, are often fed wild caught, uh, sardines and anchovies and pulling out huge amounts of those mm -hmm. uh, around South America is affecting ecosystems where native people rely on those those fish sources for food. Um, and I thought it was just a really interesting book because salmon is one of those foods that immediately, I know when I used to eat animal foods, I used to always think of salmon as, you know, the healthy, the healthy option. And mm -hmm. I thought this gave... Uh, you know, there's another side to the story. Interesting. When it comes to Tasmanian salmon anyway. Yeah. Uh, so. And when you say healthy, you mean from not just a, like an individual health perspective, but like an ecological health perspective. Yeah. Perspective. It sounds like a. It sounds much healthier than yeah. beef. Right. You know. Right. Um, which you can connect to the kind of environmental impact a little more, yeah. I think, when you think of a cow and methane and deforestation. True. Uh, and like all of the uh, feed crops that are required for factory farmed animals anyway. Yeah. Uh, so that's a that's an interesting book. And it also goes into the dyeing. Uh, they dye the fish pink because they're actually, they're gray. Mm. And they wouldn't be so appealing if they were. The shelf the, appeal if the Atlantic, Yes, if mm. the Atlantic salmon was gray. So right. that's one. Uh, Johan Hari, he wrote a book called Stolen Focus. Mm -hmm. And he did a great podcast with Rich Roll called uh, Why You Can't Pay Attention and How to Reclaim Your Focus. I listened to that. You listened to that? Yeah. I think that is one of the best conversations that I've heard. Brilliant. Br hands down. I, you know, you know, on, on how uh, technology and our phones have completely stolen our focus. Mate. And unless you listen to this, um, you know, you, you need to be aware of how they're ta stealing your focus, your your attention, in order to uh, tap into some of the tools that will allow you to reclaim your focus, be more productive, ultimately be happier, mm. look after your mental health. So, um, I yeah. thought that was exceptional. I couldn't agree more. That was a very enlightening conversation. It even changed my behavior I immediately. I want to get one of those phones. Yeah, it's just a basic phone with no apps. No, mm. uh, essentially, just make a call, receive a, t a call. call text that's it that's all you need in a way the problem is us as humans will find a way around these these obstacles that even if we put in place for ourselves we find a way around them like you can have screen time mm -hmm. you know uh, alerts and alarms and and lock yourself out of apps and stuff like that but it's hard it's a real proper addiction mm -hmm. but i did change my behavior for about a week <laughs> and then it just slowly crept in but i'm aware of it now every time i, I I'm Just aware too, but it, they're so good. Have you done this? It's have you hard. have you have you gone like this? I've done this like maybe ten times over the last week. I've I've gone like that and just bounced. Mm. I put my hand out to go to pick up the phone. As I'm about to go, I, go, I don't need it, and I pull my hand back. And I've literally physically done this so many times. I go, no, you don't need it. So it, it worked. Good on you for the podcast, guys. It, it's helped. Yeah. So listen to that episode. Check out the book uh, Stolen Focus. Yep. If uh, you want to learn more, and then my last one is. Uh, this is more, uh, it's, 
I guess it's non-fiction, fictiony slash non-fiction. Mm-hmm. It's a, a Netflix uh, series. This is the the first season, uh, Vikings Valhalla. And uh, shout out to a very good friend of mine, Sam Corlett, who is one of the, I guess, two or three main um, actors in the show. Yeah. And oh, cool. yeah, so I think uh, if you if you like the previous uh, series of Vikings, which was on SBS, um, then you'll really love this one. Even if you haven't watched that, you don't have to have seen the first Vikings. Cool. This is set um, some years later. Nice. I haven't seen that. I'll check it out for sure. I'm nearly ready for a new show. So that sort of leads me on to what my, uh, my show is that I've been watching. I've just sort of started. I'm on to season two, but this is a, a show called Alone. It's on SBS, SBS On Demand. This show is brilliant. This is real reality TV. So it's not that fabricated, manufactured kind of scripted reality TV. This is filmed by the contestants. Wow. They are given a camera kit. I think it's like four or five cameras. They're shown how to use them. There's a whole training that goes into it. They are dropped on an island, Vancouver Island. There's 10 people. First season was just 10 men dropped on Vancouver Island on their own to survive in the wild. They film the whole thing themselves. They've got cameras on tripods. They've got some selfie sort of tape stuff. And it takes you on a journey into the psychology of human beings when they're put into a, in a position of solitude, like real solitude, not just where we, you know, the solitude that we kind of experience day to day where you might meditate for an hour or be alone in a park. This is survival. So what they do, what they're given is 10 things they can take with them to survive. And obviously those 10 things have to either help with food, fire, shelter, or water. And they're left on their own in the wild. Last man standing wins. Do they get to choose those 10 things? They choose out of a list of about 50. So you right. have to choose wisely. What Everyone, everyone's choose? are a bit different. Well, if you asked me that before this show, and I And like have, water is one of those? Or, no, you, or you can get access to a creek? You have to have access to natural flowing water. So okay. it's a creek. So what, they've done, what they do is they drop them off though in different positions on the island. And, and the resources in these positions are very different. Some are close to a beach mm. with free flowing- What about food? Fresh water. Find it. Good luck. Gotta find it. Yeah. And in this particular place, the main source of food is um, is fish. One of the guys was actually vegetarian. Really interesting. And he was eating fish for the first time in many years. Mm. And you could see the relationship that he had with the fish under those circumstances not only made sense for survival, but you could see he honored the life of the animal and he was so aware of what he was eating compared to the culture. Mm. And, so yeah. is there other food as well? If you can find mushrooms that are edible, if you know Mm. seaweed, kelp. So, I mean, they're hungry. These people are really hungry. So, essentially what happens is 10 people on an island, last person standing. You can tap out at any time. You've got a satellite phone. You can say, I'm done. I'm out. Here's the thing that makes it interesting. 7,000 black bears. I'm making these numbers up, but it's close to this. 7,000 black bears, 200 cougars, wolves. So, you're- Come on. I'm telling you- What did they have to do? Sign a waiver? Surely, they signed their life away, 100%. But you can tap out at any moment. So a lot of contestants had their first encounter with a black bear. They're out, done. They could not do it. They couldn't face it. And the last person standing wins half a million dollars. You don't know how many people are left on the island because all you've got access Mm. to is is just you on your own. So it could be 50 days, 100 days. You don't know. So every camera angle is them. The only people on the island is them. There's no camera crew. Zero camera crew on the island. First aid. There's B-roll emergency. footage, but they get it all before they get there. Right. They dropped off helicopter or boat, and then that's it. Alone. They've got a first aid kit. They've got a satellite. So they are from, actually alone. One hundred percent alone. But the beauty about and this they, show, can they work together at all? No, no, no. Every man for themselves. You don't see anyone the whole time. Oh, you don't see anyone. No, th- and all of they live so in they're about just self. The self self tapes, and you live in about maybe a two, three hundred. How are they charging meter. their devices? I, that was my question. I don't know. I want to find out about that. I was really interested in that. There's got to be maybe a solar powered sort of battery source in that Mm -hmm. big case. Um, But the the part that I found so fascinating about this show is what do you think these people missed the most while they were out there? You see, I'm talking, you see the toughest, strongest ex-military, ex-police men crying like babies. Friends and family. That's it, mate. That is it. Not once do you hear someone say, well, in the first season anyway, not once do you do you hear them say, mm. 
I miss my the car. craving connection. I miss my house. I want that food. No, they're starving. They're hungry. They want their loved ones, their wife, their kids. That is it. Family, companionship. And it's just the, the impact of solitude on these people, it exposes all this raw emotion mm -hmm. that otherwise, like most men, I'm sure you do it too, shove it down into that jar, tighten the lid, hope mm -hmm. it doesn't come up. Well, here it comes out. And it's just beautiful to see these guys opening up and how – Really, we've got a, a solitude deficit in, in this society that we live in. We're never alone. We're too comfortable. Way too comfortable. Not enough time just on our own mm -hmm. to reflect and gaze inward. And I just thought it was, it was such an eye-opening series. That's where I think that phone, without the gadgets and stuff, apps on it, but you can still make a phone call. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, I'd love to go away for a weekend by myself, mm -hmm. just get in nature. But you would want your phone in case you needed to make a call. But you've got it there for the emergency call. That's fine. Yeah. It's good to know. So that's where having the phone without any apps would right. be great. Exactly. And I've got a few friends who've been going to these nice little eco cabins. They're mm. minimalism cabins. So there's no distractions. You bring a book with you or a guitar or whatever it is. You spend two nights in these cabins and essentially you just tr try to be a part of nature for as long as possible. And then you come back to, to the real world. But I think that offsetting our quick modern world lives with that experience is something we don't do enough mm -hmm. of. And you and I, we've been talking, we want to go camping. We've been saying this for ages, but we've got flooding now. The weather's terrible. And, you know, you were overseas in America and all sorts, but we, we've got to do this. Mm. We, it's, watch this show, then we'll do it. We'll create fire. We'll, you know, it'll be an awesome, awesome experience. All right, man, I'll hold you to that. I think we have done it. We have. I think we got through we what have. we wanted to talk we about. Left out, I left out one thing, but you know what? It's, we'll save it for another save time. It. How yeah. do you think we went? Man, it was really fun. I enjoyed that sort of free-flowing format. I think that you and I have discussed enough nutrition chat and stuff offline as well. That we it's, still it's snuck nice. a bit of that in there. Of course. It's always going to be there. It's part of who you are. Uh, but that, was, that was really fun, man. Thank you. And the new studio is awesome. Happy to be here. The last time we did a pod was in Byron. Mm. In that little it was cabin. raining. It was raining. A lot. It's raining still. <laughs> um, yeah. The only difference is I didn't have my guitar. You know what? I'm going to gift you a studio guitar. Yes. We'll hang it up on the wall here because yes. if you have a guest who knows how to play, maybe it's you a good can idea. F put that into the, the, the episode every now and then. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you for that coming That was awesome. Back. Thank you for what having me. Sixth time? I don't know. We stopped counting. Okay. See you again soon. <laughs> Can't wait. Thanks, man. Thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science-based conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app, wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a comment on the YouTube videos or a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take notes of these comments when planning for future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. That's theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.